Hello, everyone, and welcome to One Civil Law, where we learn through the misfortunes of others. As always, I'm your host, On Civil Law, a licensed attorney in Texas, Virginia, and before the United States Supreme Court. And as always, I hope you're just having the most fantastic of days. For today's story, we turn our attention to Leah Remini. Leah Remini is an outspoken person, a actress, an outspoken person against Scientology. She was involved, and her mother was involved in Scientology for many, many years. And she left Scientology about a decade ago and has not been a fan since. She is talking about her experience about Scientology in many forms, including on her own shows, as well as Joe Rogan and other podcasts. She is no fan of Scientology. And she has filed a lawsuit against the Church of Scientology for effectively uh, for effectively um, disparagement and libel and slander, defamation, and also for harassment. We have so far covered her initial complaint as well as the church's response to their initial complaint, which was in the form of the anti-SLAP motion. SLAP stands for Strategic Lawsuit Against Public Participation. It is a special motion to dismiss that's been adopted by several states that basically comes in the First Amendment arena. The different states have different rules about it, but effectively, at diff to different levels, it is meant to ensure that speech that is legal is not unduly uh, brought into court because we don't we want to silence it through the mere process of litigation. So this is something some states have adopted to varying degrees. Uh, the federal government hasn't adopted it yet, but that's kind of what they're doing. So they filed a motion basically saying in so many parts that what we've done is protected free speech and therefore you should not allow this lawsuit to go forward. So far in our analysis, we have seen some trouble when it comes to Leah Remini's suit. So Leah is suing the Church of Scientology as well as its leader directly. And so one of the problems we've had to tease out as we've covered this is the degree to which the evidence points to actions by those groups, right? Because those are who we're trying to sue. We're trying to sue the church and we're trying to sue the leader, David Miscavige. So we need to find the evidence against them. And we have some evidence that members of the Church of Scientology, or at least people are affiliated with it, let's say it that way, have taken actions at times that could be seen as harassing or otherwise threatening against Leah. But that, of course, isn't by itself enough. Just because a person is Christian, for example, doesn't necessarily mean that their church is involved, even if the church is making preachings that could be seen as somehow tied to the person. You need a little bit more than that. You need a little bit more than just, you know, church says stuff, person does thing. You need a little bit more of a command, a little bit more of a direction. And, you know, some of the church's practices in what they do is not entirely dissimilar from what other religions do. For example, they've been accused of disfellowship. They've been accused of, uh, you know, not allowing members to talk to members who have betrayed the church. But of course, that isn't quite unusual. You know, the various churches in the world take quite a dim view to apostasy, and it is not unheard of for churches to command or otherwise perhaps encourage its members not to deal with people who have been disfellowshipped. Of course, the Islamic faith is famous for that. The Amish are famous for it, and the Mormons are some of those groups, and some Christian sects as well. So, you know, merely because we don't like them, please don't associate with them anymore. They're bad people because they're apostates doesn't quite do the trick either. You know, just because we're like, you know, people are who have disfell who have leave the church are bad and you shouldn't like them isn't quite enough. So we're looking and we're looking for things where the church has directed or commanded, you know, a little bit more direct. And we didn't really see that in the filings and the church's response as to defamation was fairly persuasive. Leah Remini has said a whole bunch of things against the church and the church has struck back and the church's comments could be seen as substantially true. So we saw some problems for the lawsuit and that's sort of where we're sitting right now. The sort of analysis as we're seeing today is that Leah Remini is on the back end of this and the case is likely to be dismissed. But of course, we must consider further documents as they come along because that's how courts roll, right? Our initial impression may not necessarily be correct. So for today's case, we will be reviewing her response to the anti-slap, the response to the special motion, and we will entertain why that, uh, you know, entertain the issue about why the church is responsible. What did the church do? 
Or what did David Mascavige do? And what evidence is there to support that? So that's the sort of thing we're looking for today. Let's go ahead and get started with this. And thank you, Robin, by the way, for being a member for four more months. And Helen as well for giving me an emoji of a, of a, I guess, fox who appears to be laughing. I appreciate it. Let's go ahead and get started with the legal filing. We are, of course, in the trial court in California for Los Angeles, Rotelay Remini versus David Miscavige, the Church of Scientology International, and of course, it's Religious Technology Center. So that's what we're looking for. We're looking for what those people did, you know, and the degree to which people who aren't those people, the degree to which the church can be held responsible because they directed it or otherwise they're agents. Those are the kind of thing we're looking for. So let's see if we can find it. Amy's been a member for five months. Thank you very much. All right, let me uh, redo the margin slightly because it's a little bit out of bounds and that's not great. Give me just one second to fix the margins. Okay, there we go. Great, all right. Oh, that's the wrong document. First, we're gonna deal with the uh, plaintiff's motion and then we'll get into the declarations. That was the declaration I had on screen. We'll get into that later. First, we'll deal with the motion itself or the response to the motion, I should say. So we have a whole bunch of authorities, table of contents. All right, so let's see what Leia has to say about why this should not be dismissed. For 10 years, the defendant, David Miscavige, the Church of Scientology International and the Religious Technology Center have waged a coordinated campaign to obliterate and utterly ruin the plaintiff. Defendants have engaged in countless false and malicious attacks on Remini through multiple Scientology-run social media accounts and websites. Defendants have physically harassed and stalked Remini, her family, and her colleagues. That The evidence for that so far has not been particularly great, but maybe they'll get into it. Messages obtained between private investigators hired by Scientology to follow Remini that reveal that the word is Scientology want to kill her. Although it's pretty unusual for a church to hire you know, a private investigator to follow people around, of course, that isn't illegal. People hire private investigators all the time, and spe especially to the degree that people are moving through public space, there's no expectation of privacy. So just because they hired a private investigator, which is kind of weird, but it's not illegal. So, you know, we'd have to look for a little bit more than that. Scientology is a multi-billion dollar organization headed by Miscavige. Scientology's self-described reliable source, Mark Rathbun, a former member and official of Scientology, has repeatedly accused Miscavige of criminal conduct. In 2013, when Remini publicly left Scientology, following a childhood subject to abuse and later psychological torture and punishment, defendants deemed Remini a suppressive person and fair game, and according to Scientology policy and practices set up to destroy her reputation, her livelihood and her life as they've done in so many others. Okay? Defendants claim fair game does not exist, which, you know, would be helpful if you sh can show defendants actually made this declaration. That would be nice. Um, defendants claim fair game does not exist, yet stand behind their own exhibit, which shows a former member of 2016 accusing the Scientology of engaging in fair claims, including terrorism with a whole pipe. Yeah, just because they submit the exhibit to show something doesn't necessarily mean that they agree with the exhibit. The exhibit can be used to show other things. So, you know, there's that. Uh, a few months ago, Scientology tried to make a deal with a public defender to frame Remini for defense alleged attack involving a security guard. And we have a declaration, so maybe we'll get to that. Or there was one, and we, we didn't really see great evidence for that, to be honest. Rathbuns previously wrote about enemies of Scientology depopular to the total pole of obliteration. Fair game is active and well and knows no bounds. Okay. Scientology misuses the anti slap statute to continue to further bully its victims. All right. Defendant relies primarily on a singular declaration of the Lynn family, a Scientologist. A witness declared under oath to this court in a previous case that Fanny, a low level Scientologist, lied in declaration to the court. Here, too, Fanny relies on fabricated and inadmissible evidence. Defendant's motion should be denied for two reasons. First, defendants have failed to make their burn under SLAP. California's version of SLAP is fairly generous, comparatively, so we should be looking to 
probably, you know, grand all things considered in the first instance. Uh, well, to the degree it, it deals with assault, an anti-slap motion wouldn't apply, but of course we need to find evidence for that. That is the churches. Second remedy is demonstrator claims are likely to succeed. I'm not sure about that, but maybe they'll persuade me. Scientology deems individuals or entities who criticize its conduct as enemies or suppressive persons. Scientology policies mandate that Scientology treats suppressive persons as attackers and totally restrain or muzzle, obliterate, and utterly ruin them. We saw some language about this, by the way, in earlier declarations from Leah, but those statements from the church went back into like the 70s, and, and the church says they don't do that anymore. And I can't really speak to the degree to which that's true, obviously, but you know the fact that the statements that they had were from the church, you know, 50 years ago is a little bit unhappy. You know, you'd want something a little bit more recent, ideally, that shows that they're still doing this. That'd be nice. Um, Scientology directed followers, or at least did at one point, to spot who's attacking us, start feeding lurid, blood, sex, crime, actual evidence on attackers in the press. Don't ever tamely submit to an investigation of us. Make it rough, rough on attackers all the way. They definitely said that at one point. One way to utterly ruin an individual deemed a suppressive person is to financially ruin the person by attacking their source of income. These tactics are commonly referred to as fair game and carried out by the Office of Special Affairs, which with Scientology is their intelligence and spying operation, which is also a little weird for a church to do, but of course doesn't necessarily make it illegal. You know, you need to look for the acts of the thing rather than the thing. So we'll, we'll get there. One way to ruin that is to ruin their supports of income. Okay. For decades, Scientology has terrorized individuals using fair game. And we have a declaration from Rinder, which apparently speaks to this, which we will read as we go on. Remini was a child when her mother forced her to leave her home and join the C organization, which runs all of Scientology's operations. Remedy was deprived of all formal education and made to perform manual labor and spend hours learning the teachings of L. Ron Hubbard, Scientology's founder. Again, by the way, this isn't necessarily unusual for various churches and stuff. Uh, again, you could compare it to the Amish, which, based on my understanding, also has children participating in activities to the degree that they're physically able and so that isn't necessarily a problem because it isn't necessarily work within the meaning of statutes, right? Because it, it especially to the degree their parents are sanctioning it, you know, you're, you're having a different understanding. So child labor laws may not apply in these kinds of situations. So because, of course, there is freedom of religion in this country, and we do have to remember that as we are trying to interpret any statute. So... Freedom of religion obviously is more important than a statute, so to the degree to which there's a conflict, religion would have to win, so we have to bear that in mind as we're understanding the analysis. Remini was forced to undergo thousands of hours in training and move up the bridge to freedom. Again, compared to your faith of choice, it is not unusual for parents to take their children to church, including multiple times a week, and by the time they hit 18, and also go to Bible camps and other things. So by the time they hit 18, it might not be unusual for your typical child somewhere to undergo thousands of hours of training. That doesn't sound inherently ridiculous. Of course, Scientology has to be judged in accordance with other religions because, you know, that's how we roll. So every, you know, that's one of the things, right? You know, what what is true for one is true for all. So you can't like. You can't say Scientology can't do things that other churches can do. That's not how that works. You know, either they can all do it or they none do it. The law has to apply to everyone equally. And maybe Scientology goes too far. I'm certainly welcome to that, but it would only have to be too far in a way that it would be too far for every church, right? They have to be treated the same because that's how we roll. All right. These training sessions involve verbal, physical, and sexual abuse practices. To the degree it's sexually abusive, not so much. That would not be a thing a reasonable church could do. To the degree it's physical, we'd have to understand a little bit more about what physical is exactly. But sexual abuse, not so much. 
Remini estimates that she spent over $5 million as a member of Scientology on her so-called spiritual licensement. That seems a little high, but again, it's not necessarily unusual for people to spend money on the Scientology on their spiritual their spiritual you know journey. Although five million dollars seems a little bit high, but of course not necessarily illegal. In 2006, Remini was shocked to discover that her longtime friend Michelle Miscavige did not attend the Church of Scientology's wedding of the century be Tom, between Tom Cruise and Katie Holmes. Yeah, you know, uh, Miss Miscavige, the wife of Scientology, has not been seen in public for quite some time at this point. So, you know, there there is that. Uh, I'm not sure why the police aren't taking that more seriously, you know, with the missing person and everything, but, you know, okay. Remini inquired about Shelley's whereabouts and reported to Scientology her concerns about Shelley's health and safety. Remini was ordered to go to Flag, consider the spiritual headquarters of Scientology in Clearwater, Florida, which is my understanding that's true. Thank you, Tammy E., for the 20 gift memberships. They are extensively appreciated. And thank you, Amy, for being a member of Five Months. We appreciate everyone who is part of the Uncivil Law support group. We appreciate it. We appreciate our members. Okay. I'm not sure why it's not appearing on screen. The fact it's not is irritating me right now. Why is my thing not? There it is. Thank God. Uh, and thank you, Jaska, for gifting 10 gift memberships. We appreciate it. All right. Years later, when Remini asked questions about report of abuse against Scientology, she was again punished for six months. In 2013, following the last punishment, Remini left Scientology. She was not expelled. And also, by way of example, of course, a lot of Orthodox religions in particular tend to be pretty insular, and they tend to not like when their members go to civil, civil, civil authorities. So you'll see this in Orthodox religions as well, Orthodox Judaism, Orthodox Christianity, where they really kind of like everything to be held internally. They don't really like civil authorities, you know, so that's not inherently unusual for religions. Of course, people can still go to civil authorities, but the church is not required to like it, you know? So they're not required to like it and they, they can kick you out of the church because it's a membership organization. So they can't stop you from going to civil authorities as such, but to the degree to which they, it's a religion, they can choose whether or not you're a member of the religion. So again, not necessarily uncommon in particularly strict religious face, faiths. In 2015, she was released, she released a memoir, which included her upbringing in Scientology from November, 2016 to 19. She created, produced and hosted an AE documentary series Leia Remini, Scientology, and the Aftermath, which told stories of former members who were bankrupted, physically abused. Again, physical abuse wouldn't be protected. You know, just because they're using physicality, maybe, but abuse, no. So, you know, splitting that difference can get a little hairy, but, you know, if you cross the line, you cross the line. Molested, absolutely not protected, and raped, which would absolutely not be protected either. By Scientology and how the organizations covered up the crimes Family destroyed by Scientology's disconnection policies, which that part isn't unusual for religions, as I've noted, and those who suffered retaliation for reporting crimes to non-Scientology authority. Mere, mere religious action would be protected. So, yeah, that would be valid because the church, because we allow freedom of religion. So if the nature of their retaliation is merely, you know, you're not allowed in the church anymore or something akin to that, that would be legal. Sahar Silverman gives five Canadian dollars. Says, I just have to say, though, as an Orthodox Jew, call Ma, it is true that in some very closed off factions of Orthodox Judaism, but that's a rarity. I understand that it's a relative rarity. I understand that. I wasn't trying to claim it was true for all Orthodox Judaism or all Orthodox or all Orthodox Christianity. I was just trying to point out that it can happen and does happen in specifically more Orthodox faiths. And, you know, your Orthodox may not do that, but some do. And it has to all be okay or not, not okay. 
right? So it has to, it, this has to be an all or nothing proposition because Scientology can't be judged worse just because you don't like their religion. That's not how this works. So either it's all okay or it's not okay. Either it's okay for a church to do it or it's not okay for a church to do it. And of course, we do somewhat tend to look for freedom of religion. So we somewhat default to it's okay because freedom of religion. So, you know, that was what my point was. Hippo Lover says for $5, wife of juror number one, said I've been following this for a while. Yeah, it's a very interesting story. And I'm glad you've been following it. And I'm happy to offer my legal perspective on the whole thing. So R said, oh, I know you didn't mean that. I just want to clarify. I'm also sorry for the mistake. I use Siri. Hey, no problem. You were fine. No problem. You were fine. I just want to make sure I was clear. So you're all good, Sahar, with me. No problem. I just wanted to make sure I was clear and not, you know, saying more than I intended to say. So you're all good. Everyone is good. Scientology deemed Remini a suppressive person fair game in 2013. Yeah. And by the way, just by rational extension to the principle, if literally one person is doing something in the entire country, if it's their right, it's their right. So there might be one person somewhere who's doing something really unusual. You know, no other person would do it. But if it's their right, there it's right. Either it's all okay or it's not okay. The rights, the rights are by their nature individual. So the right of one is just as valuable as the right of 300 million. So either it's all okay or not okay. That's how we roll. Equal justice. Yeah. Scientology relentless attacks against Remini include countless false and malicious social media posts, the evidence for which is somewhat dubious, multiple Scientology websites targeting and attacking Remini, also somewhat dubious, and letters to Remini's employers and sponsors contain the same defamatory st statements, which could be a problem, but perhaps not. Robin gives 10 gift memberships. Thank you very much. We do appreciate all the uncivilian support. Scientology's attack on Remini, her character and family include that Remini incites violence and hate crimes, which, you know, eh. Remini is a vicious, lying, narcissistic, deranged, demented, and dangerous bigot, which sounds a lot like opinion, unfortunately. That all sounds like opinion. Remini is racist. Remini loves rapists, which, you know, due to her support of certain persons who were civilly found, to have engaged in sexual assault is probably a statement that's protected because it could be some person's interpretation of what seems to be a fact that exists. Remy is like a KKK leader, a neo-Nazi. Those statements tend to be protected because they're too vague. What does it mean to be like that? What does that mean? Those are too vague to be actionable. Remy inspires praise of Hitler. Remy inspires violence against, incites violence against witnesses. You know, Jehovah's Witnesses, eh. Remedy is abusive to her family and employees. That's a little bit more actionable, you know, because there's something a little bit more concrete, perhaps. Remy turned her back on her sick father and dying sister. Can't speak to the validity of that. Remy ransacked her dying grandmother's apartment, and Remedy's daughter left to a toxic home life. So some of that's protected opinion. Some of it's too vague to be actionable. Some of it might be actionable. But the evidence seemed a little bit thin, but perhaps Remini will convince me it's not as thin as I initially concluded. Scientology knows that its statements about lies. Rathburn, their most cited reliable source, is a person Scientology states is an unreliable source, a mid liar, a self confessed suburner of perjury, and obstructor of justice. Brandon Reduff has publicly stated Remini did not incite his vandalism of Scientology facility, as Scientology continues to claim, if it were that specific, maybe, but their claims don't seem to be that specific. So, yeah. Uh, and noted, Rem Scientology's exhibit shows Redarf was angry over Scientology's fair game dirty tricks against him, including abusing his pet. Again, to the degree that that Scientology did abuse his pet, that would not be legal. Fanny, whose wife was previously ordered to stop tampering with the jury, tampering with the jury is, jury is pretty illegal. In a prior case, alleged abuse by Scientology claims Remini's aftermath incited the murder of a Scientologist in Australia. Even though the court overseeing the matter did not corroborate his tall tale and know the boy could not even speak English. Well, you know, but 
it's they could have a different opinion about it and it, it could be indirect incitement in some sense you know they increased the temperature of the thing and perhaps the boy saw the temperature and blah 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 so you know yeah i tend to take a fairly strong view on freedom of speech incidentally so perhaps i as a lawyer look for a little bit more than another lawyer might work for, look for because i tend to take a pretty strong view to freedom of speech because i think it's really really important so i tend to take a stronger view so another lawyer could definitely disagree with me my, my word is not god it's just one man's opinion it's reasonably well informed professional opinion but still defendants have also stalked and harassed remini her family her friends and her business associates They've attempted to break into her house. If you can show that, that'd be illegal. Smash her mailbox, same. Rammed a security gate, same. And posed the security company to install spyware in his neighborhood home, which probably is an action the neighbor could bring, but not necessarily you. Although it might be informative as to some of your claims, so I'll give you that. Messages obtained between her private investigator calling themselves Scientology's hitmen, which is probably hyperbolic, because did they literally order a hit? You know, do you have evidence of that? That'd be nice. Reveal the word is Scientology one to kill her. Okay. Yeah. Remini has moved for a preliminary injunction against the re relentless attacks and harassment. All right, what is the legal standard? The relevant law requires defendants to show their activities are protected under the anti-slap statute. If defendants make this showing, Plaintiffs have the burden of establishing a probability of prevailing on the claims. A probability does not mean more probable than not. Only the cause of action lacks even minimal merit constitutes slap. So we require a little bit more than we typically would require in a typical claim. So typically to allow a claim to go forward, you know, on a, on a motion to dismiss, we're looking for something like 10% certainty. We're not looking for a lot. It's like probable cause you know we're not looking for a lot you know just a, just the minimum to get us over you know you know the bare minimum of, of you know thinking that this is not you know completely made up so we're looking for a little bit more than that how much are we more are we looking for i don't know it's a little vague let's say 25 30 percent maybe and just to pull a number The plaintiff's burden of establishing a probability prevailing is not high. You don't weigh cre credibility. That's true. You definitely don't do that. Nor do we weigh the weight of evidence. That's true. You don't do that in a motion to dismiss stage. That's not how you go. Instead, we accept all, all evidence is true, favorable to the plaintiff, correct, on a motion to dismiss. That's what you do. You assume everything the plaintiff says is true. You know, so that's how you roll. That's fair. But then, of course, in the anti-slap, that somewhat changes the analysis a little bit, but fair enough. In the first instance, we do assume everything you say is true. Uh, and assess the evidence only if determines if it defeats the plan of submission as a matter of law. Okay? A defendant that advances an affirmative defense properly bears the burden of proof on the defense. Fair enough. So an affirmative defense would require them to prove it to some degree of certainty and exactly what that is in California, we're not sure, but fair. Defendants have failed to show their false and malicious personal tax and remedy, her character and family were made in connection with a public issue or an issue of public interest. There must be a functional relationship between the speech and conversation about a matter of public interest. Yeah, I'm not so sure about that one, to be honest, Leia, because you know, you yourself, have done quite a lot in the last 10 years to make this a matter of public interest. You have striven with quite deliberate intent to make this a matter of public in, public interest. So if it wasn't before, you definitely have done your damnest to make a, an interest and in public interest. You have put yourself into the public's light through multiple mediums, including your own show and podcasts and so forth and so on. So, you know, you can't really complain about that now because you know, you, you, with the good comes the bad, my friend. When you make it public, they can make it public too. So you can't have it both ways. In a case similar to Remini, Monique Ratburn, married to Mark Ratburn, a former member, sued Scientology for a three-year campaign of ruthlessly aggressive misconduct pursuant to Scientology policies. 
you know, I can't necessarily speak to it in the first instance, but I would, I would assume that, uh, you know, the wife of Mark is not as public a person as you and is not striven to make it as public as you has not gone out of their way to make it as public as you. So what is true with respect to Mark's wife in this analysis wouldn't necessarily be true to you because you have elevated the standard. You know, her, his wife is probably just a private person, which requires less. You're a public person. It requires more. That's the law. So yes, the conduct include the same relentless and abusive conduct, following, surveilling, and harassing Rapburn, her home, her work, her family members, friends, and coworkers, and publishing salacious and vicious attacks. I can't speak to the degree to which the evidence supported those claims in her specific matter. So I don't know how parallel it is. I, I, I will agree you can find it, and a court did find it, in that case, but the facts, of course, as it relates to her, would necessarily be different. They can't be one for one. So, you know, that what that court finds didn't necessarily speak to you. It's informative, but not much more. Scientology's attempt to recast Rathburn's position as a complaining principally of the activities of a group of Scientology self-described as squirrel busters, cute, which the court summarily rejected, holding Scientology's conduct was not speech in connection with the matter of concern. To the degree which it's his conduct, to the degree which Scientology can be shown to do it, that's what we're looking for. It strains credulity to consider harassing conduct that Rapper complains of as having any direct relationship to the issue of squirreling on religious doctrine to the extent it could be a matter of public concern. To the extent it's conduct, I would tend to agree. Defendants challenge false and malicious attack on Remini, her character, and family, which they don't deny making, are not in connection with the issue of public interest. Yeah, see, that's where I kind of get off the train. That's where I sort of get off the train, because once again, Leah Remini has done quite a lot to deliberately, intentionally, and forcefully make this a public issue. So, you know, you can't sort of complain about it both ways. You can't have it both ways. You want it to be a matter of public concern? Great, it's a matter of public concern. Oh no, they're attacking me now on a matter of, this isn't public concern. Yeah, that's not even close to how that works. With the good comes the bad, my friend. With the good comes the bad. It needs to be a public issue though. It certainly does need to be a, a public issue, but once again, Leia has done quite a lot, very deliberately over the last decade to make it a public issue. If it wasn't a public issue before, she's gone quite out of her way to make it a public issue. So, you know, yeah, you know, you can't sort of appear on multiple podcasts and have your own television show and so forth and so on and say, oh, this isn't a public issue. Yeah, that's not how that works. Mm. Defendants rely on Weinberg versus Fasal, in turn lying on Wolfenstein versus Scientology to argue that statements against a largely unwealthy church qualify as a matter of public interest. In Wolfen, the plaintiff, former member, alleged Scientology inflicted severe emotional injury on him through certain practices, including auditing, disconnection, and fair game. After a five-month trial, the jury found in favor of that person and assessed damages of $25 million. Scientology filed an action set aside and they filed an anti-slap motion against Scientology. Scientology argued the action against Scientology was not a matter of public interest. The court disagreed, holding Scientology as a matter of public interest as evidenced by the media and the extent of the church membership. The case would find Remini's speech about Scientology, the practice of Scientology and her experience and stories of former members are in the public interest. But it's not Remini's speech at issue here, it's defendants. Yeah, but it's speech about the defendant. So, yeah. The defendant's challenge attacks are personal against Remini. They're not like about above Scientology. I can't speak to whether Wolf Scheim, you know, elevated this to a matter of public interest or public concern. But, you know, Remini has uh, definitely done the most 
arguably, of anyone to make this a public issue. She's quite intentionally tried to make it a public issue, so there, there, there's that. Defendants challenge attacks are personal. They're not like that previous case about Scientology practices, including audit, disconnection, fair game with the allegations about abuse and rape. Instead, defendants concede the church statements were made about her. Yeah. The website making personal attacks against Remini are named after and concern Remini. They're not Scientology the facts. The websites claim to prove facts about what Leah Remini did. Yeah, but you know, once again, Leah has made herself quite relevant in this issue. I can't speak to those prior cases, you know, because I'm not going to go deep dive into the facts of every prior case. You know, that's that's not fair to uncivil. He can't, you know, do a deep dive on this. He, he has to he has to maintain his sanity. But uh, I, I can say that, you know, if anyone has made this a public issue, if anyone has made themselves a public issue with respect to Scientology, it is Remini. Remini has quite this quite vociferously put himself herself into this thing deliberately repeatedly over the course of decades she has made herself an issue with respect to scientology because she did that and you know you kind of can't have it both ways so you know if scientology wants to call you a liar and point out your men if they want to point out your misdeeds to the extent they're true then, you know, there's that. So, yeah. Other YouTube crime creators have been threatened when trying to cover Scientology, one of them being Stephanie. Relentless threats she received, so stop talking. Well, I'll take note for whatever value it is that at least in the moment and also in my prior streams, I've been forecasting a win for Scientology because that's my best legal analysis. So I don't know why they'd be mad at me because, you know, I'm like, well, I, I have my doubts here. I, I'm not sure this is going well. So, you know, there, there's that. <sighs> yeah. They fair gamed her even before the aftermath. Well, the problem there is gonna be statute of limitations, right? So that's the problem there. Leia can't, go into the past too deep and be like, well, you know, before I was, uh, you know, um, the massive media personality I am, they did things to me. Even assuming arguendo that she wasn't a public person at the time, or she wasn't the public issue at the time, that doesn't matter now because we're dealing with statements that are within the statute of limitations. She can't use that in the past it's too far gone. So, so she is left with the reality that exists within the statute of limitations. And the reality within the statute of limitations is massive public figure. So yeah, I can't speak to the fair gaming before, but it's not particularly relevant now. Yeah, there's that. ICU says, apply the concept of a stalker being called out. I am, I understand. But thank you for the super chat. I appreciate the $22. Yeah, I mean, I appreciate that. And uh, yeah, I mean, if if it's true, if it's true, then it's protected. And then you're just getting into the evidence for that. And, you know, presumably in such a situation, although I can't speak to it intelligently, you would have evidence this person is in fact stalking you, right? You yourself observed the stalker stalking you or the police have found the stalker is stalking you. Or a friend that you trust said, hey, I saw the stalker stalking you. And of course you can rely on hearsay in a complaint, right? The rules against hearsay don't apply until trial. And so if this hearsay is sufficiently reliable, you can rely on it. So in the case where you're calling out a stalker and the court's like, well, what evidence do you have that a stalker? You'd be like, well, I observed it. Or my friend, who I've trusted for years, observed the stalker. Or the police, in this police report, found stalking. That would be the kind of thing you would find about. And then I, as a court, would be, oh, okay. You know, those are statements. That's, those are basis of fact. Those are basis from which you could, you could believe it. You observed it yourself. 
friend told you, the police told you, so you'd be well inclined to believe it. So, but if you just said this person is stalking me and the stalker sued and you had no evidence of this, right? I just know somehow they're stalking me. I believe it because, you know, reasons. That's not going to be good enough for me as a court. So I think I'm being fair both ways. And Leah has failed so far to point to anything that the church did directly or that Ms. Cavage did directly. So I'm in the situation where I'm like, okay, what is your evidence that they did things? They directed it. These were their agents and so forth and so on. And I found the evidence a little thin. So I think I'm being fair both ways, but thank you for the super chat. Ariel gives five gift memberships. Thank you. Is this case being heard in federal court? No, it's being heard in state court, but it wouldn't matter either way because stalking and all, all that stuff would be state law anyway. So it doesn't matter either way because all these claims would be based on state law. So it wouldn't matter if it's being heard in federal court, but thank you for the thank you for the analysis. Mrs. C says, I hope you're wrong. Scientology needs to be stopped. I may well be wrong. Scientology, Leia may yet convince me that I'm wrong. That's why we're reading it. That's why we're assessing. Right? I've just said I'm leaning that direction. That's sort of my analysis so far, but maybe she'll convince me that there's enough here. We'll see. We'll look to it. We'll, 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 we'll take a look. Keep reading. I am keep reading, man. I am keep reading. I only stop when you guys make points and I want to address them because I want to interact with you, the chat, because it makes it fun. We'll keep reading. Defendants have not demonstrated a clear degree of closeness between Scientology's personal tax on remedy and the public conversation about Scientology. It is not enough the statement referred to a subject of widespread public interest. The statement must itself connect to the contribute public debate. In fact, defendants explicitly chose not to engage in public conversation about Scientology. Scientology was provided an opportunity to comment at every episode of Aftermath, but chose to attack Remini. Thank you, Ariel, for the five gift memberships. They are appreciated. Thank you, aka Cat Lady, for the 10 gift memberships. They are appreciated. In fact, defendants explicitly chose not to engage in the conversations. Recognizing the challenge statements are not related to Scientology or Scientology's practice, defendant argues Remini is a celebrity or public figure, and those factors alone qualify the church statements about her as protected speech. No authority supports defendant's broad proposition that anything said or written about a public figure involves a public issue. Well, that would be true in some cases, for sure, because you also have the idea of a limited public person, right? So... Yes, when you have a limited public person, especially, then uh, you would only be able to comment to them to the degree that they are a public person. So the degree to which you're commenting outside of that would not be protected. So sure, if you're a public figure, some statements might not be protected because they have to be related to it. I get that. Nygaard did not redefine what constitutes a matter of public interest and does not stand for the proposition that any statement made about a person is a matter of public interest. I agree with that, but I just don't think that's true here. If this was the case, the court concluded we would obliterate the requirement there should be a degree of closeness between the statements and the asserted public interest. Yeah. In some instances, in, in some instances an individual may achieve such person, persuasive fame or notoriety that he becomes a public figure for all purposes, more commonly, an individual voluntarily injects himself or is drawn into a public controversy and therefore becomes a public figure for a limited range of issues. Yeah, that's the problem. That's the problem. That's exactly right. A person who injects themselves voluntarily into a public controversy becomes a public figure for a limited range. Yeah. And uh, she's talking about the Church of Scientology which makes her a public figure with respect to Scientology, at least. That's the problem. Thank you, my pal Sal Veltage, for us for the 99 cents of super, super chat. <laughs> While Remini is a limited public figure for purposes of public controversy about Scientology, the practice of Scientology and the stories and experience of former members Defendant has failed to show she's achieved such pervasive fame to be a public figure in all contexts. Yeah, but this seems like a related context. By 2013, when defendant's campaign of vilification remedy began, 
Remini's role in the TV sitcom, Queen of Queens, have been over for six years. Yeah, but that's before the statute of limitations. So we're not concerned with what happened in 2013. Defendants themselves, except to the degree it might be informative of a continuous range of conduct, but not by itself isolated, no. Equestrian 100 becomes an uncivilian for 99 cents by hitting the join button. Thank you for hitting the join button for 99 cents a month. We do try to make it affordable and we appreciate your support. For the, from the blanket depth description of their alleged conduct as advocating and boycotting, the challenge conduct of defendants directs her directed at her employees and sponsors or threats, harassment, and defamation, including but not limited to sending disparagement and threatening letters, attacking Paul Bursucci, the president and chairman of AEN Network Groups, by creating websites on him and a &E. They don't have, well, yeah, but they're in that context, again, they'd be talking about a &E's programming, right? That's the point. A &E, hey, a &E, we don't like that you allow this programming, particularly because we don't like Remini, who's a public figure with respect to Scientology. So we don't like that you offer her a program and a platform very much. So that would be protected, right? Without more. Harassing and stalking contributors appearing on Aftermath, including through disparaging websites, organizing Scientologists on how to attack Ms. Remini's credibility and falsely claiming her contributions criminal and paid to appear on our show. Well, okay. Uh, maybe organizing persons to falsely attack Remini as a bigot, which is too broad to be actionable and inciting hate crimes, which, you know, in, in, as long as they're not specific, right? As long as they don't say inciting the hate crime on this state, blah, blah, blah. As long as they just say inciting hate crimes, is it reasonable? Is it a reasonable thing to say that she's incited some hate crime against Scientology sometime? Probably. Equestrian gives $2. Thank you. Harassment, defamation, and true threats are not constitutionally protected speech. Yet yeah, true, but you need yeah, to find that. Defendants argue even private communications qualify for anti-slap if those private com communications further the public discourse on a public, of public interest, which sounds right to me. But unlike Murray, where communications about the dentist's substandard care were directly tethered to the issue of the public interest, the dentist's competence, defendants have failed to meet their burden to show harassment of Remini and the employers and sponsors, again, to the degree her employer is A&E Networks, you know, to the degree her sponsors are, you know, sponsors of the show, which is public, then the degree to which the Church of Scientology is saying, hey, A&E Network, we don't really like that you gave them a platform. Hey, sponsors. We don't really like that you're a, a supporter of the show, which is public, and we don't really like that very much, and we wish you would stop. You can do that. That's not invalid. You know, you need, again, something different than that. Last, defendants argue that the so-called pre-litigation surveillance or remedy is protected as part of a right to petition. Defendants have failed to show their so-called investigation was incidental and reasonably related to potential litigation and legitimate non-sham pre-filing investigation activities as opposed to a sham only intended to harass. Maybe. Defendants' separate claims that such conduct is protected under the right of free speech is subject to analysis. To the degree which we're dealing with acts and conduct, perhaps, but again, it doesn't necessarily need to be strictly related because again, a person can hire a private investigator, generally speaking, to surveil somebody, which isn't the same thing as stalking. There is a legal difference between surveilling and stalking. As silly as that might sound, but there is. Private investigators tend to surveil in a legal way. They know the boundary lines. So you can hire someone to surveil, particularly as they're in public you know, and go about their public lives because no reasonable expectation of privacy, so, so forth and so on. I appreciate, by the way, that I'm not telling you guys what you necessarily want to hear, but of course I have to be the best lawyer I can be and give you the best analysis I can. I appreciate your sticking with me, even if I can't necessarily give you good news.
And uh, that's hard, incidentally, for a creator to do, by the way, because the most obvious thing for a creator to do is just give their audience whatever they want all the time. You know, the most the most obvious thing for a creator to do is, you know, go far left or go far right and just tell their people whatever they want to hear. And that's the easiest thing to do. It's hard to, you know, be or objective because people don't really like objective for the most part. And so I appreciate those who support me and are willing to sit through as I tend to give analysis that may not necessarily be what you want to hear. It's hard sometimes. You know? Yeah. Audience capture is very real. Defendants argue that Remini made exorbitant threats to sue the church in 2013 and thus from 2013 on teen, before any of the alleged surveillance, defendants were in a protected pre-litigation statute. And even if they were in 2013, again, I'm not sure how much I care because statute of limitations. The letters were sent in late 2016 after the surveillance began. I'm not sure I have, care about what happened in 2016 either. Defendants thus can show no reasonable relationship between their surveillance and any potential litigation claim. The post-2016 surveillance conduct is also not reasonably related to the demand letters in 2017 for defendants to hire private investigators and follow remedy in New York. Messages obtained between the private investigator or Scientology hitman, which, you know, seems like hyper hyperbole. Then I mean, no one, no one attempted assassination, did they? Um... Hippo lover gives $5 with an emoji of many hippos. This pleases me. I like the hope. I like the emoji hippos. The, emo the emoji hippos are fun. We love hippos. We love you and your husband. Thank you for the hippos. They're great. Defendant surveillance was so intimidating to Remini they feared for her physical safety and were forced to hire private bodyguards. Defendant thus intended to harass non-engaging private activities. Well, maybe, but you know, again, she just might be hypersensitive and we're talking about the reasonable man in this context, you know? So if she's just a hypersensitive wallflower, you know, who, who, you know, gets surprised at anyone in the bushes, you know, at all, and then, you know, not so much. The law will only go so far. So the mere fact she hired bodyguards is suggestive, but not dispositive. Lazarus has been a member for 35 months. Thank you for being a member for so long. That kicks ass. You are awesome, and we love you. Almost three years, man. That's, that's great, man. The main defamation statements at the core of the challenge include attacks that can characterize as false. Dem Remini is a religious bigot. Too broad to be actionable. Remini engaged in hate speech. Too broad to be actionable. Remini is like the KKK and neo-Nazi. Almost certainly too broad to be actionable. Remini is a racist. Too broad to be actionable. Remini is responsible for the wave of violence against Jehovah's Witnesses. Possibly. But, you know, you'd want something a little bit more. Remini inspires praise of Hitler. Questionable at best. Remini supports and loves rapists and sexual assault. The record appears to support that because, again, Remini supports someone who was found by a civil jury to have engaged in sexual assault, and therefore that is a valid opinion because it is based on a fact that exists. So there's that. Uh, Remini has incited and responsible for violence, crimes, and hate crimes, including murder and threats of violence. It's so broad. What does it mean to be, what does that mean? It's so broad, right? Has she ever done it anywhere, anytime? Has anyone ever been inspired by her to engage? That doesn't make it Remini's fault, incidentally. Of course it doesn't, because I take a strong view, again, with incitement, right? So I need something. That's also why I'm judging the, the church the way I am. I need something more direct, right? So I don't blame Remini. I don't blame Remini legally because of, you know, I need something more direct. I need something that shows the incitement. I need something that shows legal culpability. I need something that shows accessory, conspiracy, direction, agent, 
right? So the mere fact that Remy's saying shit and someone in the broad wide world is inspired by that shit in some way to do whatever doesn't make it Remini's fault, right? So I apply that standard consistently. That's why I'm also applying it to Scientology because again, equal protection of the law, right? What's true for Remini must be true of the search of Scientology. We have to apply the standards equally in order to have equal justice. That's the only way to rule. The law must be consistent and judge everyone and everyone alike. That's the important part. Remini filed a false police report. And what does that mean exactly? Maybe, potentially, to the degree you can show it's false. If you can actually show it's false, maybe. Remini engaged in attempted extortion. That seems more something that can be proved or disproved. So that seems like something that could be actionable. Remini was abusive towards her family and employees. Again, that's more specific. So again, you're looking for support for that. And we kind of found some, to be honest. So yeah. Although again, of course, in a motion dismissed, we're not supposed to weigh the evidence. So the question would be whether Remini has provided the prima facie case. And maybe, so the church could, the, the, I could see the, the court splitting the difference potentially and allowing some of this to go forward, but not other parts. That's obviously something the court could do. Defendants do not deny that publish these statements, both online and letters to the employees and sponsors. Again, the degree to which we're complaining, hey, a &E, hey, sponsors of a &E, protected. Defendants' accusations are false statements of fact that are not privileged. Okay, maybe, let's get there. Yeah. Defendants are wrong that many of the channel statements are barred by the one-year limitations, period. Uh, okay. Defendants attack against Remini continue this day with a barrage of defamatory statements, including those described above, newly published on social media websites and articles and letters. Since August 2002, there are thousands of posts about Remini on a single Scientology social media account alone. Although, again, as a matter of law, you would look to the degree when they were published because that's the issue, right? So just because they continue to exist on the website after the date doesn't mean they're actionable, right? The question would be when they're published, just like a newspaper, just like a newspaper, right? The day is, the question is when was it published? The fact that it continues to exist on a website isn't the issue. The degree is, the question is when was it published or arguably republished? You know, if they said the same thing again, at a later date, now you have a republication. But, you know, the mere fact it continues to exist on a website doesn't do it. That's not how the law treats that. We look for the date of publication. And mere revisions to the website don't do it. You have, need to look for the specific statements. That's how the law treats it. As a standard matter, to the best of my understanding. Okay. Defendants have repeatedly posted since August 2022 links and references to the false and defamatory websites targeting Remini. So there again, you, so maybe you have potentially incorporation by reference. So you have that you have an idea there that could be that could work. The single publication rule, which is what I just said, you know, once it's published, that's the date. That's the single publication rule. Thus does not apply to websites that were republished in new posts as direct to new audience with the limitation period. Possibly by including a link, possibly it's incorporated all by reference that, so maybe you might have something there, facts. Defendants own exhibits include multiple false and defamatory statements published on or after. Okay, so to the degree, to the degree that the statements existed before 2022, because apparently it's a one year statute of limitations in California, that's how California rolls, which is their prerogative. Some states it might be two years, some states it might be three years. Like California says one year. So, okay, that's the law in California. So, yeah, to the degree that they were published before 2022, they're out. Okay, to the degree that they were republished by links, they might be back in because incorporation by reference. We saw that, for example, to highlight the point, we saw that, for example, in the Johnny Depp Amber Heard case, right? Because Amber Heard right? Was the original article defamatory? Probably not. But then, then Amber Heard said some specific shit on Twitter. 
herself in her own voice using her Twitter account, which explicitly ex addressed the article, which she also explicitly incorporated. And now, okay, all of a sudden, all that stuff is that stuff is live again because she has, through a direct statement, positively affirmed it and said, yes, this is true. This is true. This is great. I love the article. The article is great. So could they sue for the original article? Probably not, but Amber Heard opened her big mouth directly. And so that didn't help. So that's an example. Hippo Lover gave another super chat of $5 with more hippos. We love hippos. And Lazarus has been a member. It's not it's another super chat. I just thought it was, but we don't mind recognizing them twice. Because I didn't tag it as acknowledged. So but we love Hippo Lover. Hippo Lover can get two acknowledgements. That's fine. All right. Defendants argue most of their year-long and ongoing attacks of remedy, like bigot, hate speech, KKK, neo-Nazi, racist, violence against Jehovah's Witnesses, inspires praise of Hitler, love, rapists, are merely opinions, hyperbole, and subjective judgment, and also too broad to be actionable. Defendants' argument is baseless. When defendants repeatedly publish these statements, they make clear statements they were facts and the truth and real statement. But even if they said they were facts... It doesn't matter because they're so broad that the law won't acknowledge them. Because what does it mean to be a neo-Nazi? What does that mean? Especially in today's age, right? They're just too broad. What does it mean to be a racist? What does that mean? Right? So without more, such statements tend to be non-actionable. They're just too broad. We what does that mean? It doesn't mean anything, right? Or it's too broad to be... So even if you say, even if I say person X by is a fact racist, it's like that doesn't mean anything or it's so broad to not mean anything. That tends to be the, wall, the way the law goes. <sighs> Choosy Heretic says, personally, I never had any problems with Kurt Audio on the count on my 69 stereo cup system. Well, be that as it may, we try to make it really good audio for everyone. And I think we've achieved it. I think we've achieved it. I think we've gotten the audio as clean and good as it can possibly be. I'm not sure there's anything more we can do. So we've gotten the audio as professionally dialed in, I think, as possible. Although I did screw a little bit with the uh, settings on the uh, compressor to bring the volume up about 2 dB. So we're still screwing with exactly where that setting should be. But I brought it down, and then I brought it back up, so... <laughs> trying to find the exact band to make it right. So we, we continue to screw with it, but it's about as good as it can be. Yeah. That's how hypersensitive we are over in, in, in Uncivil Land. We're playing with fractions of DBs and stuff like that. It's good. Sing? Okay. Sing... Sing a song, make it simple to last the whole night long. All right. Let me emphasize this, the facts, lay a remedy, the real story. Announcing the website reveals facts, calling campaign with facts. So they say they're factual, but still. All defamatory statements challenged on the case of the real story. Yeah, they say they're factual, but still. Even defendants argue they're speaking the truth when they say she's a religious big and engages in hate speech. Yeah, but those are so broad. There's a problem. It's good for us professional musicians, man. If I'm getting this to professional quality, I've truly achieved it. Plus, I have my orange microphone cap thing. So I have the orange microphone now the orange, arc of my orange microphone foam, which pleases me because orange is one of my colors. We like the orange hearts. So the, I have this orange microphone cover, which pleases me. So that's nice. Yeah. The only other thing I could theoretically do is like change the microphone position so like the entire microphone is in shot. But why? 
like just to show off oh yeah it's a some symbi- you know so it's like yeah that's the, the only thing i can do is change it so it shows off that the whole entire microphone but it seems like a little much <sighs> whatever anyways carrying on in addition, Overhill Farms versus Lopez, on which defendants rely, makes clear by terms like bigot or racist, or KKK being a non actionable opinion, or name calling when used in some abstract or general sense, but not when viewed as specific factual contact. Yeah, but that you need that. So, yeah, that's, that's the law. That's correct. Defendants there specifically accused Overhill of engaging a racist finding and terminating a hate group. Of Latino workers, which the court rule held were provably false. Uh, as it relates to a specific thing, maybe, but I'm not sure that's what's true here. Here, two defendants, here, two defendants accused Remini is a religious bigot or KKK neo Nazi when viewed in a specific factual conduct are provably false. Are they, though? Are they? Yeah. Defendants state that Remini's more infamous acts of bigotry are, are false reports to police, false reports to police would do it. And two back-to-back extortionist demands, that would do it. These are provably false statements fact. Those parts are, I agree. Those parts are. So, yes. Defendants also say when they use termitry, they mean hate plus violent, which I know I'm sure that matters. And explain that Remini's and her producers have preconceived agendas intended to cause as much harm as possible to the church, its members, and the leader. We have documented hundreds of violent acts have incited. To the extent that those exist, then, you know, fair. So maybe Remini makes it past a motion to dismiss. Possibly. But, you know, once we're into a summary judgment, I have my doubts. I also have my doubts on the motion to dismiss phase, as I made clear. But the motion to dismiss is so low. You know, the standard is so low and so pro plaintiff that, you know, there is that. So and that's fair. But then, of course, again, in SLAP, we're supposed to, like, look for free speech. And so there's that. And people, of course, are allowed to say vile things in America. Thank God. In America, hate speech is legal. There is no such concept as hate speech. It doesn't even exist as a legal concept. There is no such thing in American law. It doesn't exist. So yeah, you can, you can be hateful. In fact, such speech is afforded, if anything, more protection, you know, for example, in the famous case, when the ACLU still had balls, when the neo-Nazis wanted to have a parade through Stokey, Illinois, they wanted to have a parade and do their neo-Nazi thing and march in the streets with all their neo-Nazi stuff, and the ACLU, when it still had balls, went to bat for the neo-Nazis. Because, you know, freedom of speech, which was correct. People are allowed to say vile and hateful things. It's legal in America. Of course, you are under no obligation to like it. You are allowed, of course, to express your own speech, expressing your opinion. That's the whole point, right? That's the whole point. They can say what you want. You can say what you want. You can say, I don't like that speech very much. That's some bullshit. You know, Nazis suck balls and so forth and so on. That's your legal protection. You get to parade. They get to parade. Everyone gets to parade. The law protects us all. And thank God for that, as far as I'm concerned. These two are false statements. Scientology explains that when they attack someone as a religious bigot, that person is driven by hate inspired stereotypes. That is too provably false. I don't think it is. Whose documentary statements are based on a harrowing 35 year personal experience, which involved abusive practices. Eh, I'm not sure about that. Defendants argue, def- don't yell cry- fire in a crowd theater, don't quote Schneck. Don't quote Schneck. That's, that's, don't, don't do that. <laughs> it's been repudiated. <laughs> don't quote that. Remini and attacks of Jehovah's Witnesses accusations. There's no connection between Remini's episode of the aftermath, allegedly attacking Jehovah's Witnesses, and the wave of violence against Jehovah's Witnesses in the halls of Washington. Um, 
I'm not so sure about that. I mean, not directly, but, you know, she's saying things and violence occurs. And it's reasonable to say that she's in some sense inspiring it, encouraging it in some vague sense. Again, not in a way that would bar, bar legal liability in any way. She's not legally liable, but to say that she's inspiring it doesn't seem inherently ridiculous. You know, she's obviously helping in some sense. So, you know. Remini inspires praise of Hitler. Defendant exhibit speaks for itself. A news organization tweeted, appeal court revives harassment suit against Church of Scientology and Danny Masterson. Remini then responded to that tweet and said, this is a major victory for brave women who survived Danny Masterson's predict prediction and Scientology stalking and harassment thanks to his fair game directives. Masterson, a Scientologist, was charged with and convicted of mobile counts of rape. There's no factual basis for staying Remini unhinged propaganda and bigotry inflamed a public support for Hitler. Yeah. Inflamed is so broad. You know, it's like, yeah, I don't know about that. You know, and certainly no evidence remedy post advanced the genocide against Scientology. Yeah. Remedy loves rapists. Yeah, this one, I don't think, I don't know how, I don't know how Remedy's going to get past this. This one's going to be hard. The family claim that Randy incited genocide by supporting rape victims cannot be reconciled with her claim that she supports rapists. May the inflamed post don't disclose the basis. Yeah, they don't necessarily have to disclose the factual basis. There just has to be one for the statement. They don't necessarily have to make it clear. Yeah. When defendants do not, while defendants do try to justify the attack, they say Remy supports rapists because she testified in Paul Haggis's civil rape trial. Haggis was never criminally charged. I'm not sure that matters. And defendant's own exhibit shows Remini believed the judge should judge him with all the evidence has been taken. Fair enough. Fair enough. But, um, you know, a reasonable person could potentially disagree with the judgment of the jury, potentially, and say, and, and he, you know, and, and say that she supports the person accused of rape and is a rapist. It's kind of a thin line, but okay. I don't know about that one either. Remini's abusive employer accreditation. Defendants do not deny the real story is that Remini abused her assistance. Defendants argue there's a long trail of former employers and coworkers who have assisted, attested the workplace is abusive, point only to the false and defamatory websites they complain about. There's no long trail of three inadmissible statements on which defendants rely. Oh, why? I don't know why they're inadmissible. They don't say why. Uh, only manager ever worked with Remini when she was 13 years old, and Remini's not seen her in the last three decades. What well, that's valid. I mean, she might be a 13 year old, but if she thinks that she was abused, which which is you know, if she thinks that, you know, the Church of Scientology can say, okay, well, we rely on that. It's not inherently absurd, right? Unless there's some something more that makes it inherently cuckoo. So. You know, just because the court comes out one way doesn't necessarily require you to agree with the court. I disagree with courts all the time, including on matters of law, including the U.S. Supreme Court. You're allowed to disagree. You're allowed to disagree with the jury. And as long as, you know, it's not insane, you know, unmoored, cuckoo, you know, it's reasonable for you to say, well, I just disagree with the assessment. The law protects your right to disagree. Moreover, defendants' operas claiming to be a journalist came to people puzzler sat asking producers about claims that Remini is abusive. Yet defendants did not point to a single person who confirmed the claim. Defendants' agents, in fact, said Remini were overall nice to others. Well, those people might have said that, but if other people said the other, then et cetera and so forth, right? So there might be evidence that Remini is a great employer. That's not really the relevant question, you know? Now, again, of course, this might make it pass a motion to dismiss, although I'm doubtful, because we don't weigh an emotion to dismiss. We assume everything the plaintiff says is true. But then again, the slap. So there's that, and they have to prove it, but they're kind of on their way, and so forth and so on. Just a kind reminder, or a kind thank you for everyone who has super chatted and issued new memberships so far in the stream. We really do appreciate your support of the channel. It makes it possible for us to continue giving you high quality legal content, I hope. 
I prov provide the best legal analysis. That's my goal. I hope I achieve it. And if you like that, I hope that you watch. And of course, I might be wrong because judges disagree with each other all the time. I'm not, you know, God, but I hope you appreciate the logic of my analysis in any event. Thank you. If we get some more super chats, I'll sing some more. How about that? We get another $50 in super chats, I'll sing some more. How about that? That'd be good. I'll sing for my supper. Well, defendants acknowledge that they have the burden to establish the defense for truth. Defendants have failed to deny the truth of any of the vicious attacks of Remini. Defendant attacks Remini's incite violence, including murder, and Scientology are false. Under California law, it's a crime to engage in conduct that urges others to riot. If you're actually urging it, then sure. The person must have intent to cause the riot. Exactly. Remini is not inside violence or hate crimes. In a legal sense, possibly. Possibly, but you know, again, when we're talking about statements in any context, we're talking about how the how the reader would read it. That's the relevant standard, right? So we're looking to how the reader would understand it. So what what legal, what is legally precise is not necessarily what the reader would understand. So when a person hears incitement, when the average ordinary reasonable person hears incitement, I seriously doubt they think the Brandenburg and the precise test for incitement. So I, I don't think it's necessarily correct to say, okay, this is false in a legal sense. Because even if that's true, the question is, what does it mean to the reader? You know, what does it mean to their audience? So, you know, there's that. $10 on the way. Can I please cover Missouri versus Biden? Possibly, it depends on whether or not I think it will be widely received and liked. But maybe we'll put mods, put that in the potential queue for consideration, and we'll consider whether or not it will be sufficiently popular. So thank you for that. We do try to aim to attract the widest possible audience because we want to give good education to the widest possible audience. That's good. That's a good thing. Okay. She's never called for violence. Precisely the opposite. Remini has publicly condemned the actions of the 16-year-old boy who murdered a Taiwanese Scientologist. Yeah, it's Australian headquarters. Further, defendants failed to muster any evidence to support a single credible threat or act of violence they incited, much less the hundreds which they claim they maliciously act. And we might make it past a motion to dismiss on this. To support these broad assertions, defendants point to six specific acts of violence they say Remini incited. Um, we need a new channel, I think, in Discord for discussion of cases that we think might be good. Um, let's talk about that later, but we probably need a separate channel that, you know, makes it, well, we could put, we, and we, we, we need a separate channel to like, maybe do that. We'll talk about it. Murder of Yat in Australia. Defendant's connection between the murder of Yat and Remini is not only false, but unbelievable. As to that specific murder, possibly, but Scientology didn't make it that specific. On January the 3rd, 2019, a 60-year-old man stabbed to death a security guard at Scientology Church in Australia. The assailant had expressed anti-Scientology Scientology sentiment. A church staff member who witnessed the crime asked the assailant's mother what he was reading on the internet about Scientology, and the mother showed the church staff member the link to a Chinese anti Scientology website on the phone. This information was poured to CSI after the incident. On January 7th, I accessed the website, saw it contains Remini's The Aftermath Show, as well as Mike's website. I download and close the exhibit. So the link that the person apparently found contained a copy of the show. So, you know, there's that. Maybe he doesn't speak English, but, you know, maybe, you know, it was informative of the website and so forth and so on. And maybe he had translate. I don't know. There is no cooperation of the story in the court proceedings for the murder. The court heard Tiny's boy stabbed a man to death. After becoming angry, his mother deleted his pornographic story from one of his devices. 
The boy first confronted his mother about the Dalia data at the Scientology facility where she was taking classes and then beat her up. The next day, he went back to the facility and insisted he wanted to speak to a staff member about the data, but was told if he attempted to enter the building, it would be locked down. An altercation then ensued between the boy and Ye, who was present, and the boy stabbed Ye. The boy was found not criminally liable because he was experiencing a mental impairment arising from psychotic symptoms, which, you know, fair enough, but isn't necessarily the end of the story. You know, just be, you know. Fanny also does not state the CSI report on the information about what defendants claim was the cause of the murder. To the authorities, this is one expected they actually believed it was the cause. The only evidence defendants cite to support their argument is the murderer used a cell phone to view an anti Scientology website that featured a link to the show. Is false and defamatory. Is a false and defamatory letter Scientology itself wrote to Paul saying, Blood on your hands, claiming you paid for the hate that caused this murder. Okay. Even assuming, I mean, it's statements to A&E, so it's a little. Moreover, even if there were admissible evidence, the mentally ill 16-year-old viewed the website. Defendants do not claim he scrolled to the second to last comment containing the link, but you don't have to necessarily claim that in that level of specificity, right? That's, we're not trying to, we're trying to prove a little, something a little bit different here. The boy did not even speak English. Defendants all but concede the repeated claims Remini incited were made up. Erin McMurthy during her car, drove her car through the front door of Scientology in Austin. Defense argued that what, when McMurphy was arrested, she told no one was hurt. She replied, that's too bad. Defendants falsely quote the police affidavit. McMurthy didn't say she wanted hurting one. She responded, that's too bad to the police saying she drove in the nursery in the facility. Okay. Further police report indicates Aaron was asked why she do this. In response, Aaron did not mention Remini, and Remini is nowhere mentioned in the police affidavit. Eh. This is Remini's lawsuit against Scientology. Brandon Randolph smashing a hammer through Scientology window. Defense argued that Randolph's connection to Remini is they attacked a Scientology church in anticipation of Remini's appearance on 2020. Even if this were true, which is not, Defendant's statements that Remini inspired or incited when he has yet to see the appearance are obviously false. No, not necessarily because he might be wanting to see her because of that kind of thing. Yeah. I, I don't know that she's bringing other uh, religions under this. I'm not sure about that. Defendant's cite email Raisdorf sent to his aunt Jury, a Scientologist state, Scientology is going to burn like hell in a handbasket. If you don't believe this, just wait till April 29th and 30th. The email does not mention Remini or the April 29th program. Okay. In addition, the single email upon which they rely for the fabricated statement Remini incited vandalism states Radorf, a fine Scientologist, was angry because of Scientologist's fair game and abuse of his pets. Stop harassing my effing cat. As soon as your fair game dirty tricks kick, into attacking humans and stop harassing my pets by trespassing last Thursday and spaying my cat or spraying my cat with the hose pipe. I'll be legally packing heat. You effed with the wrong person. Defendants' own incomplete excerpts from the appearance on the Aftermath show show that Randolph, a former Scientologist, angry with Scientology. Yeah, but that's a show that you participate in and, you know, that you certainly increase the heat for and so forth. So, you know. I just felt like we got raped by the church. And what do we know? You know, yeah, someone just switched in me and I was enraged and I felt disgusted. But why, what Scientology truly is? This person who did the murder was 13, I think. Why did she mention Jehovah's Witnesses? Oh, she didn't mention them. Uh, Scientology, well, I don't know the degree to which she did, but she's quoting, Sci she's quoting Scientology, which said she was responsible for violence on the host witnesses. So she didn't bring it into this lawsuit. Scientology did. So she was just quoting them or referring to them. On their website attacking Resdorf, Scientology claims the murder, a former, the, the Scientology claims the mother, a former Scientologist, was the blame. 
Fennett also tried to blame Razdorf acts on anti-Scientology publications. Razdorf explains that after he was arrested, Scientology's lawyer handed my lawyer a paragraph that would be my apology to the Church of Scientology. Basically said the reason I did this was because I read books that were anti-Scientology or I went online because the media and stuff was about Scientology, which was not true. The reason I did it was because they destroyed my life. Okay. The police incident, the police incident report on which defendants rely states case stated unfounded. Further, according to defendants own exhibit, Scientology had already brought Kenny before his alleged act where he tweeted Timmy. Trimmy. They're trying to show like reasons why it's reasonable not to view it this way, but you know, I don't know that that really does it, you know? Because the question, of course, ultimately, at the end of the day, is first, did they misstate a fact? And these specific examples don't necessarily preclude the fact. And second of all, uh, you know, there's an anti slap motion, so there's definitely that. Mm, Oreo. Don Miser's arrest after he entered and refused to leave Scientology. Myers was not a staff photographer for Aftermath. Remy does not know Myers. On January 8, 2020, when defendants alleged Myers stated, I'm setting you, the police, up to be on Leah Remy's show. Okay. Aftermath was no longer on the air. Okay. Defendants also argue the church has documented the hundreds of threats to Scientology posed by Remini's followers. The so-called documents, again, were created by Scientology, where they falsely claim that Remini is responsible for hundreds of threats and acts against Scientology. When we say responsible, maybe in some vague sense, you know, they did JW Special in Aftermath, there you go. In other words, defendant rely on the truth of the same statements they made online that Remini alleges false and defamatory. Defendants cite a total of five so-called threats in addition to one plaintiffs have shown are fabricated. Defendants do not claim that the report, any of the so-called threats to police or took any other actions, certainly do not claim the police have arrested, charged, or indicted anyone for making these so-called threats. They may not be legally actionable. As I said, they may not be Remini's fault legally, but that isn't necessarily what we're talking about here because the question would be how the reasonably prudent person would interpret it. And I'm not sure they necessarily would interpret it by its literal legal connotations. Bennett argues that within an hour of debut of the second season, then proceed to list a threat to the church's website. Nothing in the document re references Remini or a show and Remini's show already aired weekly for seasons. Three seasons. Thus, any of the many threats Scientology received could occur hours or days after the episode aired without any truth. And yeah, if every threat was reported to police, exactly. Defendants report repeatedly and falsely accused Remini of other criminal acts, including filed false police reports. Remini filed a missing person report related to her longtime friend, Shelley Miscavige. Remini not seen her friend for years, did not know of her whereabouts or whether she was alive, and generally concerned for her friend's life. Remini's never been investigated for filing a false report. In their defamatory attacks, defendants claim the LA Times called her missing person report a despicable publicity sign. These two are false. They're Scientology words, not the LA Times. Okay. Okay, there's something, right? There's something. So if they're referring to filing a false police report and the despicable publicity sign is Scientology's own words, that doesn't work. So there you go. There's something. There's something because, you know, she has every reason, every right to file a missing police report relating to a missing person. And there, she has reasonable basis to believe she's missing. Haven't seen her in years. And so Scientology saying it's despicable doesn't do the trick. So there you go. There's one that might make it past the motion to dismiss. So there's your hope, right? There's your hope. So, and of course, if one makes it past the motion to dismiss, if any one of them make it past the motion to dismiss, then even assuming others are dismissed, then 
then as discovery might go on, they might find further evidence that might allow for causes of actions to be revived. So the court may dismiss it for the moment, but as evidence discovered may allow for it, they may allow to revive. So a court can, of course, reverse its own judgments as the evidence changes, which they should as the evidence changes. So there you go. That's that's the best I see from remedy so far. So that we we are now looking at a decision I would be looking, let me put it that way, I'd be looking at a decision where I'd be dismissing many parts of this, but not necessarily all of it, which would probably be enough for Remini going forward, to be honest. So there you go. That's nice. Defendants falsely accused Remini of additional criminal acts, including attempted extortion of $1.5 million from the church. In October and November, in response to Scientology's claim of false and defamatory attacks, seeking to ruin her reputation and interfere with the upcoming series, Remedy's lawyers sent two civil demand lawyers to Scientology. A civil demand lawyer is not an extortion or attempted at extortion. Mm, maybe. I might let that one go through the gate on a motion to dismiss. Yeah. Castro, as Castro points out, you know, I don't know. I know. I, I know something about Scientology. I know sort of the highlights of Scientology, but of course, as always, I endeavor to interpret a case based on the legal filings in that case, because that's what a court should do, right? The court should look to what is brought in this case. The court shouldn't concern itself with information outside the case. That's not how we roll. So even if, I, even to the extent I know things about Scientology outside this case. I should not factor them in because that is not material to this case. What is material is, you know, what this case shows. So that's that. Okay. Remini has never abused her family members and she did not turn back on her father or sister when they were mentally ill or ill rather, or ransacking her giant dying grandmother's apartment. To the contrary, Ramini housed her father and paid for treatments while he had cancer, paid for her sister's bills when she was in the hospital, and allowed her father to take what he wanted from the grandmother's apartment. It is also false, Remini's daughter left her toxic home life because Remini called her daughter a C-word all the time. Fans portrays the ac accusations Remini abused the family member as facts and the real story, but does not defend the truth. They just say in videos that they made and posted, the persons, however reliable, made the accusations. Okay, maybe you get past that one too. That might work. On a motion to dismiss, again, where we're not weighing the evidence. So that might work. Evidence of actual malice is overwhelming. Even assuming for the sake of argument, Reminis, Remini is a general purpose solidity person, which she's not, and I don't think that's relevant here because I think she's a uh, limited purpose public figure for this purpose. There's more than sufficient proof of actual malice to satisfy the standard applied. Actual malice standard requires knowledge. The statement was false or made with reckless disregard. To constitute reckless disregard, defendant must apologize for a false statement with a high degree of awareness of its probable falsibility or entertain serious doubts. As the anti-slap stage, a public figure who sues for defamation must establish a probability. He or she can produce such clear and convincing evidence, but need no dues outright. Courts take a holistic approach that examines the totality of the circumstances to determine whether they collectively give rise to an inference of reckless disregard. In 2013, when Remini left Scientology, defendants declare her an enemy and suppressive person. Since that time, defendants have engaged in a relentless, vicious, decades-long campaign to destroy and ruin that Remini, but of course, I'm only particularly interested in what might have occurred during the statute of limitations. For decades, Scientology has engaged in similar efforts to destroy other deemed enemies throughout its similar tactics. Defense the evidence shows want to kill Remini. Yet they want the court to believe they never lie about her, the substantial evidence to the contrary. We don't weigh evidence, that's fair enough. Defendant makes up facts to advance the argument. They claim Remini engaged in attempted extortion in 2013 to argue their surveillance from 2013 onward was protected pre-litigation investigation. Saying only their false and defamatory article posted on LeahRemineFacts.org. The man letters were sent in late 2016, and they explicitly called her out in other defamatory attacks. Defendants repeatedly attack Remini as having incited 
hundreds of specific threats and attacks of violence by assigning their own defamatory articles, attacking her and disporting and misrepresenting the evidence. Maybe, but we don't weigh the evidence at this stage, so, you know. Further, after Resdorf publicly stated that Remini had nothing to do with vandalism, defendants continue to falsely claim that Remini is responsible. Scientology's own excerpt sh exhibit shows Remini was angry over Scientology for the fair game tactics. Okay, maybe. You might be able to get past that on a motion to dismiss, possibly. Defendants cannot defend the truth of the statement that Remini is responsible for a single threat, much less a hundred of them, and they relentlessly and falsely claim. To the extent that Scientology said specifically this, one, yes, but again, to, I don't, don't think Scientology spoke that specifically. I think their claim was more broad, you know, just generally responsible for attacks, which is obviously harder to show to be false. Defendants' other malicious attacks abound. The defendant claimed Remini's November 18, 2018 episode caused a wave of Jehovah's Witness attacks when four or five of those attacks took place before the episode. Well, that would be hard, I'm sure. Including eight or nine months before the show aired. That would be hard. This is similar to knowingly false that you're acting in anticipation of the anticipation of appearance. Well, not quite, because they might have anticipated because of Le Remini's reputation. So that's not quite accurate. Defendants state Remini filed a false police report when Scientology knows the comment here does not even seek to defend the truth. Defendant asks the public defender to have her client lie and says the alleged attack involved. Well, if you can prove that, um, that they pay, that they pay, asked a public defender to have their client lie, then maybe, but I'd want some evidence of that because I'm going to assume an officer of the court wouldn't do that. Um, the public defender reported the misconduct, reported the misconduct to the presiding judge, and they asked me to see above section one. Okay, give me a second. So we're on page 27. So what did they say on section one? Uh, uh, they're citing me all to the specific facts. Is that what they're doing? Yeah. So I don't remember that unless it's in a footnote. I wish they'd given me a more direct, a more direct citation. I, I just, courts don't really like it when you ask them to go hunt. If that's true, you should provide a more specific citation than just see above section one. It's like, give me a break. All right, we're on page 27. Defendants argue even if their statements are false, they're not malicious because they're based on reliable sources. Defendants may reliable sources, Scientology previously called an unreliable source. That's a problem for them. Adding Rathburn is admitted liar as well as a self-confessed suburban or perjury and obstructor of justice. That's a problem. We can't say it's reliable and also unreliable at the same time. You know, we kind of can't have it both ways. Expelled from the church 10 years ago, Rathburn is a lunatic with a history of psychological problems and rest and admitted criminal acts. His madness and reckless disregard for truth manifests itself when he accused a highly respected state judge in Florida of being on the take and the FBI director being a punch. Well, yeah, you can't, you know, say but simultaneously they're reliable and unreliable. That's not how that works. Remini has established the requisite probability of success because Evans shows defendants extreme and outrageous conduct to cause her to suffer emotional distress. For a decade consistent with policy, defendants sought to ruin and destroy Remini through relentless attacks on Remini and her family through countless false and vicious Modi PD posts, mobile websites created solely for the purpose of attacking her and her letters to employers. Okay, yeah, again, sort of like when we're, when we're considering intentional infliction of emotional distress, we must necessarily consider the degree to which the person invites it on themselves, right? Because you can't sort of, you know, you can't open the door, as it were, and then complain that people walked through it, right? So intentional infliction of emotional distress will necessarily be informed by the degree to which the person you're talking about has invited it. And again, Leia has somewhat put herself in the public. So we're, we'd probably be looking for a little bit more than we'd be looking for, you know, a typical person. Leia Remini has gone quite a bit out of her way to make herself specifically a public person with specific respect to Scientology. 
numerously, repeatedly, many times over the years. It's kind of been her shtick. So we, we, we need to consider that as we're weighing whether it's intentional infliction of emotional distress. Defendants will also follow, surveil, stalk, and harass remedy your family and colleagues, none of which fall within the First Amendment ambit. Defendants' extreme and outrageous conduct has caused remedy to suffer severe emotional distress. The evidence on actual malice is overwhelming. Defendants' surveil conduct was not protected by pre-party litigation. Possible. Defendants argue many of the putative claims for ID are barred by the two-year statute of limitations. Defendants' arguments include allegations they do not argue should be stricken. For example, the August 2020 break-in, and thus improper. It might be improper the degree to which you will uh, tie it into specifically Scientology's direction, but, you know, we'll, we'll see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oreo. Oreo makes but Oreo makes things better. Oreos are good. This video is sponsored by Oreo. I wish. Defendants engage in unlawful violence, incredible threat of violence, and knowing or willful court. If Oreo wants to sponsor me, though, I'm here for it. Defendants engage in unlawful violence, a threat of violence, and knowing or willful course of conduct directed at a specific person that seriously alarms, annoys, or harass the person and serves no legitimate purpose. The course of conduct must be that which would cause a reasonable person to suffer severe emotional distress and that must actually cause the distress. Unlawful violence includes stalking, a credible threat of violence is knowing and willful statements, or a course of conduct that would place a reasonable person in fear of safety or the safety of the person's immediate family and serves no legitimate purpose, which is where you're going to get into trouble a little bit with the private investigators. My dad worked for Nabisco 20 years, had Oreo every day. Jealous. Can your dad hook me up? Being a 28-year veteran, can he hook me up with some Oreos? You can send them to my P.O. box. I like Oreos. Let me know if Oreos are on my way. I will get them. Defendant's course of conduct includes hiring private investigator companies and agents, stalk, harass, and surveil remedy while going about personal and professional activities. If you dip Oreos in sour cream, it tastes like Oreo cheesecake. I don't know about that, but I'll give it a shot. Yeesh. I'll give it a shot. The worst it can do is be completely unpalatable, which I can solve by more cookies. Agents of Scientology and individuals hired or directed by Scientology have attempted to break in their home, smash your private residence with a mailbox with a hammer, rammed in the security gate with a vehicle, and posed as a security company for the purpose of invading the cyber. Yeah, you don't really have evidence that they're agents, though. That's the problem, right? You say that. You say that. But you don't really seem to have evidence of that. You don't really seem to be able to specifically say these are agents. You're just kind of assuming it. And so that's too speculative. And so I can see the court discounting it. Cream cheese, yes. Sour cream, no. Ah, uh, fair enough. Can you point to your own declaration as evidence? Yes, you can. Sure. You can point to your own declarations of evidence, of course, because to the degree it's things that are within your knowledge, of course. You're a valid witness. Of course you can. You know, so the degree to which you know things, yeah, of course you can point to your own declaration. So, you know, if you witnessed it, you observed it, of course you can. Of course you can. It's testimony. It's testimony. Testimony is evidence. Since the filing of the First Amendment complaint, Remedy has been subject to stalking and harassment by defendant or agents or individuals directed, including an attempt to break in the neighborhood and hacking your credit cards. But how do you know that? What is your evidence for that? You can't just speculate yourself into it.
In addition, the physical threats of violence to her own property, defense have also engaged in coordinated social media campaign against Remini using Scientology operated websites and social media accounts to viciously attack and harass. Yeah, I, I, I will take note here that merely because they're saying mean words isn't legally necessarily harassment. It can be, but it isn't necessarily, particularly to the degree that all the factors we've talked about, people can be mean to each other. It isn't necessarily harassment. Remini's fear and distress here is particularly reasonable as she is intimately familiar with the defendant's fair game tactics and knows will stop at nothing until her life is destroyed. That helps a little bit. That helps a little bit for the prima facie showing. Private investigators hired by defendants to stalk and surveil Remini reveal Scientology wants to kill her. Scientology's had to, she's had to hire private guards. Defendants wrongly alleged decade-long and ongoing barrage of victims' false and defamatory statements is protected action and non-actionable. The right of free speech is not unlimited. Various categories of speech are not protected in California, including but not limited to defamatory speech, frightening words, true threats, and speech that constitutes harassment. In Huntington, the court affirmed the trial court's order in joining the defense from posting or maintaining any website, any information regarding a person known to believe the patient, parents, plaintiff's employee, or family member, friend, or business associate. Well, that's an order after a hearing, which is a little bit different, of course. So they could order this in the future, but it's not, you know, it's, it's, it isn't true yet. So, um, in so holding court noted that when considering a website constitutes a credible threat, context is everything. And thus, even a communication that might be ambiguous or is fake, construed a threat would constitute a threat when considering all circumstances possible, possible. That might work. That's a possibility. So maybe she can hack enough together between the church's statements and their fair game policies as she alleges them. And as I understand, Mike is going to further allege, maybe she can hack another enough together to get her past the motion to dismiss on the infliction of emotional distress. Maybe it's possible. Here, the court must consider the entire background and factual contact to defend and suppress a person, fair game campaign of harassment, and intimidation remedy for the last 10 years, including the social media campaign falsely and maliciously attacking. Yeah, well, stuff going past, stuff going back more than two years would be relevant to a pattern in practice. So you can't use it in and of itself, but you can use it to show a pattern in practice. This is what they were doing, you know, for eight years, and, and this is also what they're doing two years as part of their pattern in practice. So you can use it that way. So that's fine. Things are beginning to look slightly more up for Leah going forward. So that should hopefully please some people in chat. You know, things are looking more up for her. So that's nice. Enjoying defendant's harassment against Remini does not amount to prior restraint of speech. Well, after the full court hearing, yes, ultimately, but as a preliminary stage, a little bit less true. Okay. Harassment, defamation, and constitutionally protect are not protected. I have a little audio on my lip. Thank you. First, well, further, once a court has found a specific pattern of speech is unlawful, injunction prohibiting reputation is not prohibited restraint. Fair. But on, a mo on, the, on an emergency basis, you know, courts can and should look at it a little bit more skeptically because, of course, they haven't been afforded due process yet. And due process is important for everybody. And neither the First Amendment nor the California Constitution prohibits court from issuing an incidental restraint on speech that's content neutral and narrowly tailored. Well, this isn't content neutral. This is about specifically, you can't talk about remedy. So that's not content neutral. So for, forget it. For all the reasons stated above, remedy has established requisite probability of success for stalking and fends false and defamatory statements and surveillance are not protected or protected pre-litigation investigation. In addition, the relevant analysis the court must make is whether a credible threat could be implied from the entire course of conduct, not just the statements. To the extent that you can show their defendants, yes. The relevant analysis is not here whether each individual expression is a threat, but whether in combination. Fair, to the extent they're defendants. 
Lopez court held the defendant's entire course of conduct, including the content of his blogs, message, letter, and packages, and presence, persistence with which he contacted the plaintiff, despite being told to stop by her and the police, revealed an obsession a reasonable person would understand as threatening, especially when they tell you to stop and they're not making themselves a topic. Yes, that case makes sense. Defense position also finds no support in Counterman versus Colorado. Such a case is inapplicable here because unlike Remini, the plaintiff and counterman had no evidence. Defendant actually followed or surveilled plaintiff. That's kind of the problem here. The issue is before the court and counterman whether the true threats of violence still requires the defendant to have subjective understanding of threatening nature. However, even if the counterman were applicable, which it's not, plaintiff can prove with respect to communications, defendants disregard a substantial risk, their communications would be viewed as threatening of violence. Mm. Maybe. Defendant's, defendant's entire modus operandi with respect to teaching is specifically intended to cause terror. Maybe. Possibly. To the extent that you can show that. That'd be nice. Yeah. So maybe your declarations will flush this out a little bit better. In some of this, I'm willing to certainly consider more about how true how especially in your personal observations and experience how the uh fair game works and is you know more recent than 70s that'd be helpful plan stalking claim is not barred by a three-year stack of sacho limitations well kind of is but defense have stalked surveilled harassed and intimidated remedy by various means and occasions well within the statute yet yeah, to the extent it is then fair Further, the continuing violence violation doctrine applies if defendants have engaged in a pattern of frequent acts, such that it could be treated as an indivisible course of conduct. Possibly, possibly it could. That's fair. You know, to the extent that it can be seen as one massive thing, then you could go theoretically back. Maybe it's possible. So she's not wrong. So I stand at least slightly corrected on the law. Fair point, Remini. If you can, if you can show. This is continuous, and then you might be able to go further back. That's 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 fair, reasonably reasonably well noted. I don't mind being corrected on the law. She's correct. That's right. Remedy's tortious interference allegations are largely the same. Among other misconduct, defendants have engaged in tortious interference with Remini's contractual relationship with iHeartMedia and Audioboom, and engaged in tortious interference with respective advantage by making intentionally false and defamatory claims. I am less convinced of this, but maybe. Defense also directed individual to follow and harass Remini's podcast producers until the producers grew so fearful they decided to terminate. I'll just simply note that a boycott is not illegal. You know, so if you want to boycott a brand and you tell your other friends, hey, I don't like this brand, we should boycott them, and all of them contact the company and be like, or they're, you know, whoever they're working with and be like, we don't like that company, they're bad, you shouldn't do business with them, that's protected free speech. So a boycott alone isn't going to do the trick. Defendants also called and emailed iHeartRadio's executive vice president. Chief communication officer, producer, and audio editor in attempt to prevent the podcast from airing, which might very well be protected. Similarly, defendants sent letters attacking Remini to Audio Boom, chief content advers and advertisers, including six E's mail to the CEO of Pretty Litter Alone, a client not even associated with Ready Remini's podcast. Well, maybe they just thought that person needed to know that not to do business with them in the future. That could work too. Eventually, Audio Boom terminated its contract with Remy because defendants harassment and intimidation. Eh, maybe. Well, you have a declaration from you, Remini, that says this. Uh, it would be nice if Stand, it would be nice if any of these people had a declaration. You know, you can't speak for someone else. So I don't have to believe you that they did that because you didn't provide me. You're citing your own declaration. That isn't anything that you personally observed. And even if they told you that in an email, I'd still preferably want it from them directly. That'd be nice. 
As a result of the tortious interference, Remini's contract with iHeartMedia was not renewed. Her contract with Audio Boom was terminated, and she suffered economic harm, including loss of revenues and fees. Likewise, Remini suffered the loss of prospective economic advantage, including loss of fees. Defendant argue Remini has not shown an independently wrongful act, breach, required for at-will contracts and prospective economic advantage. Defendants are wrong. Audio Boom was not at will, but a one-year contract. It doesn't matter either way. It's, it doesn't matter. So she might have had contractual protections. They might have breached the contract. But, you know, that's not necessarily enough. You know? So, yeah. Defendant's own exhibit shows they made the face same false claims. The religious bigot, racist, KKK, blah, 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 blah. In letters to Remini's employers and post specifically about Remini's shows. Defendants further state that the show Aftermath was canceled after inciting violent hate crimes, when in fact it was because of defendant harassment and intimidation of the audio and boom employees. And again, you cite your own declaration, which isn't particularly helpful. Where's the declaration from audio boom that says that? That'd be nice. Defendants engaged in this attack not because they're true, but to taint her reputation. Hey, you said taint. Defendants also followed, harassed, and intimidated these people. Yeah, I'm not so sure about that one. That, don't, that one doesn't sound viable. I am inclined to dismiss on the uh, tortious interference claim. So, yeah, I'm, I'm not buying that one. Is she suing both Scientology and Group and Miskovich? Yes. Has the response tie anything to Miskovich as an individual? Excellent question. Excellent question. So, fair point. We need to consider these separately and very fair point. So, uh, you need to, if you're going to sue Ms. Cavage, it would be helpful to show what Ms. Cavage did. If you want the Church of Scientology, you know, so you need to show their pattern of practice. So, suing the Church of Scientology is a bit easier because obviously the Church of Scientology is a much larger entity, which many people contribute. And therefore, showing the pattern of Scientology is a lot easier. Showing it for Miss Cabbage individually is a lot harder. So, yeah. So, to the extent this lawsuit can continue, it's much more likely to continue as to Scientology than Miss Cabbage. So, fair enough. Good question. Good question. Remini is entitled to a declaratory judgment. A declaratory judgment is proper when desires to have a declaration of his or her rights or duties with respect to another. Uh, defined. The declaration shall have the force of final judgment. Separately, Remini seeks a permanent injunction requiring Scientology cease and desist as harassment. Defendant's judgment is proper here. Declaratory judgment is proper because regardless of the title of the policy, Remini's prevents sufficient evidence to show defendant maintains and implements a policy of retribution to terrorize employers, to which you cite some new declarations. Remini's proper, properly seeks judgment and practices as unlawful. Declaring unlawful and enjoying the retribution-based policy, including defamatory tax and harassment as applied to Scientology, applies to remedy, is not prior restraint. Barney declares fair game policy was canceled in 1968. This is false. In 1968, Scientology changed its public relations approach by removing the phrase fair game while the policy itself has remained. The head of Scientology, Mike Rinder, oversaw retribution policies for 20 years before he left 2007. So that will be helpful to bring them a little bit more into the current era. So uh, that, that will be helpful. So I look forward to reading his declaration on point. Mike Rinder oversaw Scientology. Yeah, we read that part. Scientology relies exclusively on one case, Presbyterian Church in the U.S. versus Mary Elizabeth. For the proposition, the Constitution prohibits the government from interfering or declaring official doctrine of a religion. There, a property dispute between the Presbyterian Church governing body and a local church congregation hinged on whether the church had departed from certain doctrines, which would require the court to interpret those doctrines to re resolve the dispute, which you know you can't do that. So the entire dispute resolves on whether the church ignored its own religious guidance, which of course you can't get into. That's internal. The issue here for the rights of remedy other vis-a-vis -vis the legality of the actions Arise from retribution based on policies that call for commission. Yeah, I think you can distinguish that. There are limits to exercise of religious liberties. The California court, what do you mean 2007 was a long time ago? 
2007 was only six years ago. Don't, don't, don't disrupt my fantasy. Freedom of belief is absolutely guaranteed. Freedom of action is not. Fair game is... Regarding fair game policy, the court noted, in some case, the sign of college was manifestly outrageous. Retribution of active fair game exceeds the bounds. And the court likened Scientology fair game to a modern inquiry. So to the extent that other courts have found that fair game continues, this court could, of course, also rely on those as competent authority. So the ability to find fair game would also be well influenced by other factors. No, I meant, I meant 2007. I meant exactly what I said. 2007 is five years ago. Don't burst my bubble. I, I meant exactly what I said. Accordingly, we hold freedom of religion guarantees this and some other stuff. Okay. Sign and we submit it. Okay. So that brings us through the complaints. So at the end of the complaint, or the end of the response, I should say rather, Leia Remini's odds look much better for specific elements of her complaint. So some of them, like the intentional infliction or apologizing the tortious interference, I would continue to dismiss. Um, some of the stuff dealing with defamation, I would dismiss. Um, but some of the defamation stuff might well make it past a motion to dismiss. The stuff, especially as it relates to the police report thing, that looks pretty good. Um, and there's some other things here that might, the intentional infliction of emotional distress, Possibly, although I have to weigh it against the degree to which she's invited it. So there's some possibilities there. So I think the odds of Remini making it past the motion to dismiss have increased. Um, the, court, the court also could potentially, rather than allow this to go forward, strike certain causes of action and order them to, uh, with, and, and, and dismiss the case without prejudice. That would be another way to go about it. So the court could, instead of allowing discovery to go forward, could allow that, could decide, at least in part, and say, well, it's so substantial that I'm going to dismiss without prejudice to represent your claim. That could also happen. So that's kind of what I think maybe will happen. But, you know, again, you have to consider some things and there's some balance and you really have to weigh this out as a court. So, you know, I think Remini has some odds that are possible, but... The Church of Scientology still has some odds too, so it's a it's a it's more of a marginal case than I initially gave it credit for. So that's sort of what I think, and you're only looking at subparts, I think, at best. So, yeah, 1991 was only two years ago. <laughs> Uh, you can see my Oreo crumbs. Bye bye Oreo crumbs. The problem with having a really good camera. Yeah, Y2K happened. That's exactly right. Y2K happened. And uh, we're still in the 90s. That's what I'm going with. Yeah. All right. So let's look at some of this declaration. I won't read probably all of it. Uh, but I'll read some of it, and we'll see how we go. Uh, I'm a Scientologist for 30 years. I was deemed a suppressive person, declared fair game. How do you know that? Since that time, defendants under, undergone a campaign for 10 years. I've been stock surveilled, blah, blah, blah. Defendants have caused me academic harm. Despite 10 years of my life under a constant assault, I've worked tirelessly to advocate for current Scientologists, which goes a long way to showing her to be a public figure in this domain. Beginning at age eight, I effectively lost my mother as a parent when my mother joined Scientology. My mother left her two daughters alone. She could devote herself to Scientology at age 13. We we're made to leave the only home we ever knew and forced to join Sea Org. As point of joining, we we're forced to sign a billion year contract. I'm pretty sure a 13 year old can't sign a billion year contract. Pretty sure that's not legally enforceable. <laughs> I don't also don't think an adult can be forced to sign a billion year contract, by the way. I don't think that's enforceable either. Um, I was deprived of formal education and made to spend learning about L. Ron Hubbard. I was taught as a child to believe my sacrifice would save the planet. Years of brainwash and conditioning. 
Well, yeah. Put me in a position where Scientology was my only reality. As with most Scientology, Scientology is my primary caretaker as a member of Scientology for 35 years. She's had some experiences. She's well informed about Scientology, so there's that. During the period of Scientology, I was forced to pay for and undergo thousands of hours. These training sessions took forms, involved sexually abusive practices. One training tactic known as bull baiting placed me, a young girl with an older male Scientologist, who was required to find my buttons, screamed explicit me, made sexually suggestive remarks to me, and verbally abused me for hours on end. To condition me not to respond to abuse. These training routines required for all Scientologists are part of the procedures to condition Scientology to accept abuse and inflict abuse without in hesitation. These rob Meyer children of naturally protective instincts and open them up to abuse. I was also forced to undergo Scientology auditing that coerced, suggest, and demand I admit to heinous acts in previous lives, including acts as, sex acts as a child. I was taught as a Scientology auditor to demand these transgressions from others who I was administering my stuff to. I estimate that I spent over $5 million over the course of my time as a Scientologist. These funds were spent on my enlightenment. Approximately half of it was through services that I was required to pay for. As with other businesses, one does not receive Scientology services without prepaying. Like any member of Scientology, I was forced to donate to the International Association of Scientologists, which was a no exchange. I understood this to be David McCavage's war chest. I was unable to repay, unable to obtain repayment of money as I had on me and my Scientology accounts. This allowed Scientology to amass funds where former members cannot get back for prepaid services. Yeah. Once a former member demands their unused monies, they're no longer allowed to contact anyone within the organization. Scientology, you instruct any Scientology in good standing. The former member is now a refunded case and enemy of Scientology. The only person enemy of Scientology can contact is Scientology's international justice chief. And my eye is starting to hurt now, so that's fun. We have to bear through that for a minute while my eye does this allergy attack thing. So brace yourselves for welded eye for a little while. While I was in Scientology, giving millions of dollars to Scientology serves as a public face for Scientology, recruiting people, individually join Scientology, helping to move Scientology on the bridge, and donating to Scientology front groups. Blah, blah, blah. The campaign to destroy me began in 2006, seven years before I publicly left Scientology. Okay. The background is described solely to provide context for Scientology attacks on me after I left Scientology. Uh huh. In 2006, my husband and I attended the wedding of Tom Cruise and Katie Holmes. Davis Cavage's best friend and second in command is a high crime in Scientology to criticize him in any way. In 2004, David Cavage told an audience that is the most dedicated Scientology Scientologist I know. Things have changed. Is this a rehash of original complaint? At least partially, it seems like that, but we're going to read it anyway to see if it brings new stuff into the equation. This is newly filed, right? I'm not reading something old. I'm on page five. This is filed August the 2nd. But no, this is filed January. No, when was this filed? Uh, December 1st. This is now. We've made that mistake before, so it's always healthy to double check. All right. I was told before I could research services, I don't go ethics. That's how to flag. Truth rundown. Blah, blah, blah. Scientology is a form of truth rundowns, a form of psychological tortor, torture, meant to rewrite memories, perform, where I gave a background, rescinded all reports. I was allowed to leave flag, was forced to lie to my colleagues. I was to make amends at flag, not only to David Miscavige, but Tom Cruise. After reports of terrible abuse emerged, I endured six months of punishment for looking on the internet, asking questions. After 2013, my punishment, I formally and publicly left Scientology and became an outspoken advocate. As a result, beginning in 2013 and continuing this day, Dave Miscavige and others began a level of coordinated malicious assault. How do you know that? I mean, Scientology has forbidden or print crimes, the start of the show, blah, blah, blah. Defense enlisted dozens of Scientologists to make disparaging claims. 
How do you know that they were agents because they were posted on their website? Mm -hmm. A bit of an assumption. Discredit my truthful comments. This defendant also used and manipulated my estranged and now deceased father. Made false statements, including I'm a liar. I only want my name in the news. I not help pay for cancer treatments. The false statements were posted. Statements made by my father are false. It's false. I turned my back on my father. Scientology knows it's false because I told them. Okay. I communicate with the Scientology how difficult my relationship was with my father and continually want to reestablish a relationship. So maybe, maybe they were recklessly. But just because she says it, of course, doesn't necessarily make it true. Right? Because people, you know, people lie. So she's like, of course I was great to my father. So that, that puts them on notice that she disagrees. Not necessarily that is true. But it's a factor to be considered. Scientology is documented in my personal files that reflect this. I'm sure what you told them is reflected, sure. When my father had cancer, I flew him to Los Angeles. I gave him a loan that I didn't ask for payback. It's false. I ransacked my dying grandmother's apartment. I wasn't there. I paid for my rent when my father refused to, or grandmother's rent. Shortly before my grandmother's death, my father visited the apartment, went through things and took what he wanted. It's false. I turned my back on my half-sister. Well, again, of course, it should be noted, of course, that, again, we do assume the plaintiff's version to be true. So we should assume these statements are true. Um... So there, there is that factor in the equation as we're trying to balance this all out, right? The standard is pretty low, right? We assume everything she says is true, basically. They kind of, Scientology kind of has to prove on the law that she's wrong to a degree. They can bring some facts into that equation, but of a limited degree. Liz says, the sound so, sounds so awesome. Thank you for complimenting me on my sound. I worked really hard to get it right. And I love the orange mic. I'm glad you do. It pleases me. Kurt, so excited where your channel's going. I'm excited too. I've been in much better spirits as of late. And I believe it shows with my interactions with the chat. And you guys have been great. And I'm so happy for the 300 of you who are here. You guys are awesome. Thank you for your contributions to the chat, both in the past and in the future. It is awesome. In 2015, I released Troublemaker, Surviving Hollywood and Scientology. 2015, I traveled to New York to promote my book. How are things going over on Twitch, by the way? I don't think I've seen a Twitch comment in a hot minute. How are things going over there? 2015, I traveled to New York to promote my book. During that trip, I was followed by private investigators. I was never followed by private investigators before I left. Twitch is still going, great. Fantastic. Just want to make sure things are still okay over there. Just want to check in on my Twitch friends. This hired surveillance was so intimidating, it made me fear for my public physical safety. As a result, for the first time in my life, I was forced to hire private bodyguards to ensure my safety. In addition to physically following and harassing me during my tour, defendants sent disparaging and threatening letters to third parties who were promoting my book. Okay including but not limited to ABC News. A set to appear in Amberson Cooper. For 2016 through 2019, I produced and did the documentary. But aftermath, we told stories about former Scientologists. Scientologists attacked some people. We extended by we extended Scientology uh, opportunity to attack to comment on every episode. They didn't do that. I also actively I was also an active practicing Scientologist appearing on or you also had actively practicing Scientologists appear in Aftermath. Um, they left the organization but continued to practice Scientology separately. I agree with them after the mass saying, I love that you're here. I love you too. Even though you left the organization of Scientology, you still believe in Scientology and you're still delivering Scientology outside Scientology. You're still an honor. We allow you to have different beliefs. I respect you that you believe and you respect us that we don't. Kick ass. MLC says happy on civil is so fun to hang out with. I agree. It is, it is much better. I agree. It is much better to hang out with happy on civil than dour, depressed on civil. I, I understand completely. I'm happy that my depression seems to be really a lot better. So that's nice. We'll take every victory you can get and hope it continues. That'd be nice. Well, as a member of Scientology, I was asked by 
uh, OSA in Scientology to sign my name to letters. Uh, the letters were sent to network heads. I know that defendants through the president's office organized a meeting. I didn't know that incidentally. In the meeting, attendees were drilled on how to attack my credibility. The blank smear was made by a false suggestion. National Enquirer was more credible than my documentary series. <laughs> I mean, that's an opinion, so, you know, fair. Additionally, attendees were told to say I paid supervisors and whistleblowers, which was false. While I was in Scientology, I was given dead agent packs. Scientology packets of disparaging information was I expected to repeat the media. Okay, so she knows from her time about at least how they acted 20 years ago or whatever it was. So that's something. I mean, it's helpful. It'd be nice if we had someone a little bit more current. But, you know, I'll take what I can get. You know, and maybe, you know, we let pass the motion to dismiss on some of the stuff and deal with it in summary judgment. I could totally see a court doing that. Defendants and the defendants operas also engage in efforts to harass and threaten anyone involved in oh, aftermath. I received an email from members of the aftermath team explaining the field time was repeatedly contacted by Scientologists asking for experiences on their interview. After aftermath, Scientology publicly took credit for having secured its cancellation. Okay. Uh, defendants continue to harass me. When I appeared on Conan O'Brien, defendants opera sent Conan O'Brien a personal letter claiming I was only speaking out against Scientology. It'd be nice if you had some evidence they were their operatives. You're kind of assuming it, at least partially, so that's problematic, right? I don't really want, you see, I don't have to accept, I don't have to accept as facts things that are speculation, right? I have to accept as facts things that are reasonably based, right? So it's like, well, how do you know that? You know, that they know that. What is your evidence for that? Did someone tell you? Did they tell you? Did you observe it personally? What is your basis for this? You know, well, this is how they acted towards other people in my time is suggestive, but, you know, it's a little bit thinner than I'd ideally like. Either I'd like something more contemporaneous or I'd like something that ideally ties Scientology to these people would be really great. Got hairs on my shirt. Mean hairs. The Hutch says I'm generally happy, secret looking happier. I'm just a stranger, but worry about him. I appreciate that you worry about me. Depression is a bitch. Depression is a bitch. It is not fun. And I appreciate that you worry about me. And in my YouTube career, as some of you who have been longtime followers of me are well aware, I have gone through some particularly dark periods on streams. There have been times on this stream where it's gotten very dark and very despondent, which unfortunately was the reality at the time you know and i was endeavoring to push through but you know it was a bitch and i'm happy that for whatever combinations of reasons this seems to not be the case at the moment also incidentally while i'm at it the darker days to the extent i do have them tend to be much less in their length so like if you go back a year ago when Ian Runkle was so worried about me because he's like, he's got to leave this job, dude. He's on the edge, right? If you go back to like April of last year, when like, you know, the concerns were at their paramount, you know, my dark periods would sometimes last for weeks or a month. I couldn't get out of them. You know, sometimes they'd only last a couple days. That wasn't always true. Sometimes they only last a day. Sometimes they only last two days. Sometimes they only last three days. But sometimes they go in a week, sometimes two weeks, three weeks, four weeks. And I find to the extent I have dark days, first of all, they're not as dark as they used to be. And second of all, they tend to only last a day or two at best. So I tend to get over them much faster. So we're getting healthier. And I haven't had a dark day really at this point in like since I came back from my family, but I haven't had a dark day in like two or three weeks or four weeks. That's nice. That's nice. I'll take it, man. 
what I chalk up the changes to, I think the primary factor was me leaving my job. My, my job I used to have as a, uh, related to patent law, it wasn't a bad job in those terms. It was well paying, but, um, I got to the point where there was no, there was nothing new about it. You know, my, my practice was fairly niche, which is not unusual for a patent, for a patent person. Patent people tend to be fairly niche. They become experts in a very small thing. That tends to be common. So my expertise was in the subdomain of computers, the subdomain of databases. So basically anything that had a database in it and did a database call, which is to be sure a lot, but still is fairly niche. You know, is it a search engine? Does it do a database call at some point? Right. So after, I don't know, at some point in my journey, there was no novelty in it anymore. There's no novelty anymore. You know, I, I, I knew too much. I was too much an expert. I was too much an expert. I knew everything within my little domain. So there was nothing new because I'd seen it all. And that was really crushing me. That was crushing me because I like to learn things and I wasn't learning anything. And that happened at least that happened at the latest about 10 years into my career. So for five years of my career, I kind of knew everything within its limited domain. I was basically PhD expert within my own little domain. And there was nothing new for me. I was, I was an absolute master of my little domain. And so for five years, I underwent an increasingly depressive cycle at a minimum. It might have been longer than that, but still I went for, through increasingly, I became increasingly depressed because the fact I wasn't learning anything was becoming more and more crushing. The part of my brain that likes to learn things was not being fed and was becoming increasingly angry with me. So, and you know, that became, that was obvious and manifest and obviously, as you would logically expect, was at its worst when I left my job, right? That was the worst it had been because logically that makes sense. So it was the worst it had been and it wasn't really over for me until I actually left. Because I submitted my notice of resignation like with four weeks advance notice, um, just because, why not? And, uh, but it wasn't really over for me even after I turned in my final time. It wasn't really over for me until the date came, which was July 2nd of last year. And I think what's true, I think what's true is I've been basically undergoing a gradual recovery from this long slog of depression. It wasn't an on off switch, you know, which, you know, kind of makes sense. And so, although the relief of external pressure obviously prevented it from getting any worse, it didn't automatically make it better. And so I think what's happened is over the course of now, a year and a half that I have to increasing degrees become better from this long-term mental strain. And uh, I don't know that it's completely gone at this point, but uh, it's obviously gotten a lot better. And I think that's what's happening. And, uh, you know, so that's good. So that's basically the story in short and uh for what it's worth obviously i had for years undergone medicine years undergone therapy talk therapy from time to time i was you know doing all those things and wasn't really it wasn't really working you know at, at points i was on so many medications for depression that it was somewhat um It was somewhat making me mentally numb. It was making me uh, 
I was like losing IQ points for lack of a better description. And then it was making me uh, dead. I was on, 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 at times I was on so much medication to try to deal with it. Um, so that was fun. So that's where we're at. So there you go. Now you know the full deep story. And again, I'd like to point out, by the way, there was nothing inherently wrong with my job. Right? There's nothing inherently wrong with it. And I could see it appealing to a certain type of person for sure. If you like rote, if you are a real introvert, if you like, or if you are a real introvert, patent law is great. You don't deal with people, man. And you're dealing with technology. So you don't deal with people and you're dealing with technology. It's fantastic. And if you like things that are rote and the same every day, patent law is great. You know, they're fantastic. You'll have a great time. So, and you know, my bosses treated me well. The pl they treated me well. They didn't do anything wrong. You know, so there wasn't any of that. It's just, you know, my, my performance also was becoming increasingly off over that five years. I was having performance problems because I started not to be able to do the job. And I'd always like catch up in the end and make it work, but uh, they were showing up and uh, there was increasing indication that it was gonna result in me losing my job at some point. And uh, the writing was becoming increasingly on the wall. And uh, so I had to bail for accommodations of reasons. I could have toughed it through. I could have toughed it through and satisfied my bosses. I could have done it, but at some po at some point, I just decided to give up, and that's sort of the story. So that's what happened, at least in part. I won't say that's all. I won't say that's all of it. I won't say that's all of it. But that's it was a significant external aggravating factor. And now you know the story. Do you think it would be good for a lawyer with autism? Yeah, maybe, maybe. You have to have a, the, the, the constraint, the constraint to be a patent lawyer though, is you must have an undergrad technical degree. So as a result of that, it's somewhat naturally constrained. I think it's the only practice of law that is constrained. Any other field of law you can do, but not patent law. Patent law, you must have a technical degree. Mine was computer science in a, in a, in a not only accredited, but had to be separately accredited by something like called ABET or something like that. It was be separately accredited. So it required an additional accredit accreditation, which they had. Um, but basically any form of engineering, biology, physics, chemistry, hard sciences, you need something on those lines. Unless you want to be a design patent examiner for which you or a design patent attorney for which you don't need that. So you could do designs, I think, without the accreditation. So if you're interested in the aesthetics of how something looks, I think you can do that. So, but that's the constraint. All right, that was a lot of story. Would bio count? Almost uncertainly. Almost uncertainly. A BS and not a BA? Typically, yes. So there are constraints on it. But I have a computer science degree from a, from a twice accredited college, so it counted, and there you go. How fun. Defendant also began falsely accusing me and aftermath of inciting hate crimes. Falsely accused me in tweets and websites of causing a man to throw a hammer through a window. Blah, 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 blah. Falsely misused accused me, blah, blah, blah. I later learned that the internal investigation group was the subject of a lawsuit that did some stuff. Pay off paparazzi for information location. I'm not sure that's in legal practice. Do I do legal practice now? No. No. Uh, when I left, I went full-time YouTube. So I don't do legal practice now. I've been on a year and a half hiatus 
you're going to have sabbatical. That's nice. Um, but if I go back to law, I doubt it will be patent law. Uh, probably try to specialize in some kind of appeals would be probably my bet. So yeah, I'm not practicing at the moment. Well, that's not exactly 100% true. I'm doing a little bit of side work, but it's very minimal. So uh, I do a little bit of side work, not a lot, but occasionally in paper, of course, I'm breaded in paper. So no court appearances, but uh, yeah, anyways. Rob says that that's why I've always supported you. I know how being unhappy at job can destroy you. I also know how bad medications can screw a person over. Yep, that was what was going on. We we reached the limits, and you know we tried, we tried, we tried other things. By the way, include you know, we tried a lot of other steps before we left the job. Obviously, it was paying very well. Patent lawyers tend to get paid extremely well, so the loss the loss of the money wasn't nice. So we tried a whole bunch of other things. We tried. Um, we tried first working at home. This was actually before COVID. So I was out, I was able to work from home. I thought maybe that would help. Then we tried moving to a different state, Texas, which incidentally is not a problem because patent law, you get a national license because it, the patent law is exclusively federal, right? So you get a federal license, which means you can practice that in any state which is a nice touch, right? So you don't have to have a state license. There was a Supreme Court case about that once, just to clarify that, right? So you can practice it anywhere. So I can go to any state and put up a shingle, patent lawyer, and the state can suck my balls. <laughs> so I, I, that's nice. Um, but anyway, so I moved to a different state, thought maybe a change of location might help. Now it didn't particularly help that I was trying to reset my life and you know, get acclimated to a different community and everything, all the rest of it. That did, it didn't particularly help when I moved, like late February, twenty twenty. I moved to a place where I had no family and no friends, so I could build a completely new life with a new social circle. What could possibly go wrong? <sighs> Uh, so that didn't help, but yeah. Defense have continued to stalk me. And then for my time in Scientology, the operas were rewarded with bonus points. There are also stats for picking Emmy place of employment, blah, blah, blah. I also believe the defendants hire talent services. I arranged for talent to install free security, blah, blah, blah. As recently as 2023, and I'm not found male, which you don't know is attached with Scientology, so that's not great. In addition to physical stalking, defendant never ending harassment extended to my friends, family, and colleagues. Operatives pretending to be freelance journalists have harassed and intimidated me. Defendants, OSA journalists have written false statements and articles about me. The decade long continued harassment occurs, blah, 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 more stuff. Same, same repetitive stuff. Twitter accounts, leaving college, iHeartMedia contract. We've already kind of discussed all that. Audio boom contract. We've already discussed that game show network. We kind of discussed that. Vice News documentary that's still tortious interference with advantage, and so no. Uh, IDPR, Scientology started a new campaign in 2023. Represents hundreds of figures, made jokes, standard operating procedure for Scientology. Began an attack on my publicity firm, not sure, sure about that one either. Post following continued course of conduct. An official statement issued by Scientology after the lawsuit asserted my statements had generally had generated threats and actual violence against the church and its members, evidenced by multiple criminal convictions of individuals poisoned by Remy's propaganda, seems a little problematic. 
you want to level up your stats, you can always hit the like button and always super chat that will help your stats. Thank you, Rob Price, for being a member for 20 months. It's tutor business, blah, blah, blah. Emotional distress, we sort of discovered that already. Aftermath, we discovered that already. Blah, 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 blah. More stuff, more stuff, more stuff. Blah, 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 blah. False claims about the police report, we've discussed that. False claimant about extort, we've discussed that. And that's the end of the complaint, so fine. Or the end of the declaration, so fine. So basically not much new in there. So that's fine. Let's talk about Mike Rinder, see what he has to offer the equation, see if she can help, he can help. Yeah. The problem with becoming an appellate attorney at this point is uh, convincing someone to hire me when I'm uh, 15 years out of law school, you know? Now, I don't think it should matter, right? Because they hire, obviously hire new associates, brand new out of law school. But for whatever reason, they tend to look differently at lawyers that have experience and want to start over. So that it's a little bit more hostile out there. I'm not sure why, but it is. So there's that. So I need someone to give me a break, basically. So that's nice. Um because of my role in Scientology, I escaped Sea Org, beginning in the 50s, fair game, suppressive person, high crime, Tash exhibit one is the stuff from 1972, restraint and muzzle, Tubble two is an official level from Hubbard. One of Scientology fair claims is nosy investigation. True and correct copy of the technical manual from 1950s, this is less helpful than I'd like. 1969, less helpful than I'd like. Our view declaration of OSA official Lynn Ferry, I'm aware of Ferry statements, they have no doctrine of fair game. The statements are incorrect. I know it's because I personally carried out fair game tactics when you were the head. There you go, that's a little bit better. Benny's statement, the purported fair game was canceled in 1968's Twist the Truth. Policy letter prohibits Scientology from referring to fair game. Any statements that did not endorse violating law is fair, it's false. They destroyed MA costs at all event, even if it required illegal acts. That's a little bit more helpful since you were the head of it at the time. That's a little bit help more helpful. So that's nice. Then going back to the 60s, that's a little bit more helpful. Scientology authority with respect to its members. Taxes I employed when I was head to illegally access ME flight plans to track their movements. Um, I know this is employed since my wife and I have been harassed at airports in Scientology without having any legal means of accessing my travel plans. Breach. There you go. That's something. Mike Dorado shows 499. I want to tell you I loved you where your channel has been going. But I didn't want to think and not like your streams before. Keep it up. Well, I'll take both, right? I'll take both. You know, obviously I appreciate everyone who I appreciate everyone who's encouraging to me and validating me. Because, you know, I need it a little bit. I'm not going to lie. I need I need the validation because depression and everything. I need your voices to help deal with the voices. Well, I don't literally have voices in my head, but you understand the point. I don't literally hear voices, but I have my own internal self-doubts. So I need some of your voices to help countermand it all. And so every time, especially someone new, someone I hasn't said it before, says... You know, I really like your audio. It's really improved. I really appreciate you. You know, you're really in better spirits and so forth and so on. It really helps lift me up. It makes a difference. And, you know, encouraging me and letting me know I'm on the right track is nice. To the extent it's true, obviously. I don't want you to blow smoke up my ass. But to the extent it's true, it helps. It's nice. Thank you for saying it. All right, Scientology has for years carried out fair game. Okay, and there's some documentation related to that. Several years in which I worked for Ms. Cavage, I endured physical abuse and numerous occasions he punch, punched me. Periodically, I was incar in incarcerated by Director Ward Ms. Cavage in what he called the hole, which consists of two double wide trailers connected by a college room. Where con I, along with more than 100 members, were confined in this building for months. Wow. I'd be that'd be uncomfortable. Uh, 
All right. The hole was literally a prison with bars on doors and windows screwed closed. A security officer who slept on the floor and ate our meals within the building. Sounds fun. Virtually the only thing that happened in the hole was efforts to extract confessions. Virtually in the hole, either wrote, eventually wrote self incriminating statements. Scientology still maintained some of these confessions. I escaped Scientology in 2007. When I left Scientology, my family disowned me. My wife divorced me. My mother shunned me. My ex wife, children, brother, and sister continue to show me. That's not fun. I've spoken out about things I witnessed, spoke to the Times. Um, blah, blah, blah. Each of the above is in accordance with pattern and practice. We developed a friendship. I'm aware of Remini filed the lawsuit. I personally have been subject to the surge of attacks. I was first made aware by my stepmom and the neighbors. The day they wife my Lennon Hunters. Chronicle the events. Blah, blah, blah. I declare it to true be true. And then we have exhibit one, which is some records from this past. Okay. So here's what I think. Here's what I think in summary. I think Leia Remini has better odds than I initially predicted. I think that the Church of Scientology has done, has been correct in many of the things they've said about defam defamation. So I would expect that many of these things would get dismissed because many of them are either too broad or are, are, are based on some underlying fact or otherwise unactionable. But there's a few things in there that could be actionable, could be statements of fact for which Leia presents a, a case that is based on a more specific thing to which there's more specific evidence that the Church of Scientology knew and we're mel more well in our way. So as a judge, I'd be inclined to dismiss many of these things, but not necessarily all of them. I'd also be strongly inclined to dismiss the tortious interference claims because, again, you're kind of running into the problem of people being able to express their views of, I don't like this person, I don't like that person, you should you know, disassociate yourself with them and so forth and so on. So I'd be inclined to dismiss that. Um, I'd be inclined to allow the intentional affliction to go forward, at least at the discovery phase. I'd also be strongly inclined to dismiss Ms. Cabbage from this lawsuit at this time, because there's not really enough evidence against Ms. Cabbage. Again, you're looking for a tie to Ms. Cabbage directly, and it's a little bit too obtuse at this point. So I think you could say the church, is, there's enough evidence to at least get past the motion to dismiss stage, Again, I'm not sure that you necessarily have enough to get past the summary judgment phase, but of course that's another problem for another day when the facts are a little bit more well known. But at this time we take all of her facts as true. And she probably has enough to get past the motion to dismiss with respect to some of the defamation and some of the intentional infliction. And then of course, as discovery undergoes, you may eventually find enough to allow you to represent those arguments at a later time. Just because the court is dismissing them for now doesn't necessarily mean they're permanently gone, you know, unless the court says, you know, with prejudice and go away, but that seems a little over excessive at this time. So I'd simply say they're dismissed without prejudice based on further information that might come to light at some later time. And, you know, some of this goes forward to the discovery stage and we, we proceed from there. That seems to be the best analysis to me but of course, the court could disagree with me and might disagree with me both ways, incidentally. Of course, I'm not, you know, God and certainly not a California judge and I'm not limited in California. So I'm basing it off my best understanding as particularly informed by the parties and their pleadings about what the relevant law is. Um, so I, I think that, you know, the California court could look at this more favorably to Scientology because they have more primacy with freedom of speech issues. Um, so I could see this potentially being dismissed outright or potentially dismissed without prejudice for leave to, with leave to represent based on more constrained arguments. But that's what I think. So the odds for Remini have increased. So that's, that's what I think. And uh, also, of course, the court can take notice 
of the findings of other courts, particularly where there are courts of appeal that have validated that Scientology is engaged in fair game in the present day, they can take that as at least prima facie evidence that it has occurred here, right? So they could take the findings relating to other courts and be like fair game and they were left for like like okay that's prima facie that's occurred here i'm not saying it did but there's something to to go forward on so that seems like the best analysis in general so hopefully all that makes logical sense and uh yeah so are there any questions before i wrap this up about anything we obviously can talk about whatever um you know, that's rel we can talk about anything you want because we're at the end of the stream. So anything that's relevant to the channel, obviously. So what do you want to talk about? Is there anything else you want to talk about while I have 300 of you here? I'm not seeing a flurry of chats right now. Have I read the Franks Memorandum for Delphi? I have not. No. Should I? Are we going to have a free Christmas hangout for fun? Probably. Your openness about depression has given me the confidence to share my breast cancer journey. Cool. I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad to hear that. You know, it's just the reality of life. It's just the reality of life, and these are my burdens. You know, so you know, it's just it's just my reality. So yeah, I'm glad it gave you courage to share your journey. That can be inspiring to others, so I appreciate that. Frank's memorandum is quite the vo vo voyage through Odinism. Yeah, I'm I'm somewhat kind inclined to discount that for the moment. Maybe if we get into it later. So I don't really need to know the finer points of uh, you know, the Odinism right now. Yeah. Frank's moment, a Frank's memo is relevant to the search and seizure, which, uh, you know, isn't our immediate issue, so it's not that in interesting. Tony is, Tony is feel like an a-hole. I was subscribed. I don't know what happened. Hmm. Tony's great. Tony's a wonderful chat. Tony is a fantastic mom. He's really, really gone above and beyond, and I really thank him for it. So if you're mean to Tony, don't expect to get anywhere with me. He's talking about sublapsing fair. Okay, fair enough. I'm watching out for my mods. Be nice. Will I cover the case of YouTube content creators that have been sued? Maybe. I, I should probably do the complaint on the um, the iPhone skin thing with the uh, the uh, photograph of the electronics underwear, the, the D brand case. I should probably cover the complaint on that. That'd be fun. Ever watch Suits? I watched part of episode one and it made me mad made me mad all right because as i mentioned earlier to be a patent lawyer you have to have an engineering degree it requires a separate license all right you need a separate license from the federal government okay there's only the federal it's exclusively federal it's only federal so you need the license from the federal government so you might remember in episode one of Suits, the newbie walks through the door and what his senior tells him is, hey, 
We need this patent application filed. It's important it gets filed as soon as possible. No. He can't do that. He can't do that. He can't, he can't file a patent application. He's not licensed. Fuck you. So I was like, okay, they don't know anything. That's fuck you, stupid. Yeah. How do I go about filing a thing? Well, I guess you got to figure it out. Yeah, I guess also you're going to have to figure out how to become licensed in the next 24 hours. Good luck with that. No. Oh, they beat because of your negligence, they beat us by a day. Get wrecked. Come on. Come on. Damn. Also, I think the law at the time, although, when did suits come out? Hold on. Uh, 2011. Okay, and when was the uh, Patent Reform Act? Uh, whatever it's called. No, it's called the something something reform act. Patent Act. Oh shit. Um, it's called Sarbanes Oxley. No, it's not called what what the fuck is it called? Man, it's been so long I forgot what the Patent Act is called. That sucks. Um <sighs> eh, Lord. Law file. Since 2013. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So, also, yeah. So, okay. So, suits. So, it's wrong on the law. It's wrong on the law. Because they say, well, they beat us by a day. So, we're screwed. Not in 2011, you're not. Not in 2011, you're not. It wasn't until 2013 that the United States finally changed to first to file. It was the last holdout in the world. And incidentally, I thought it was pretty stupid. And I thought it was pretty stupid. And finally, Congress got around to agreeing with me, which was great. But in 2011, when suits started, just because they beat you by day doesn't mean that you're screwed. The, the relevant question in 2011, who was who's the first to actually invent? Incidentally, it wouldn't matter if they filed first, because it's still the relevant question was who filed first. So you can do what's called an interference proceeding, and you might still be able to win if they actually invented first. So in 2011, oh, they beat us by a day, therefore we're screwed, was the wrong legal analysis. Is there a law book you think we should all read? Um... There's a good one that I read in law school called Getting to Maybe, which speaks a little bit to how lawyers think and trying to analyze both sides of questions. That might not be, might, not might be bad for a, for a casual read. So give, get, give Getting to Maybe a shot. That might be good. Tries, it's basically a book to try to explain to brand new law students how lawyers think. So it should be fine. You should be able to deal with it right now. Hunter says you're reading it right now. See, there you go. Yeah. Hunting, getting to maybe is basically in the end about how lawyers need to keep their mind open to mobile different possibilities. And that's where we, and how we ultimately get to it depends basically is the answer to every question. Because we need to know more, we need to know more. And then even when we know everything, we're still dealing with a judge and how they might think and so forth and so on. So how to get to a place where you're dealing with multiple, multiply inconsistent thoughts at the same time. It could be this, or in the exact opposite, it could be this, or somehow still in the exact opposite, it could be this. Three things are exactly opposite of each other somehow. This is, yeah, I can have, yeah. yeah. It's supposed to teach how to do well in law exams. Yes, it does, but 
it, I think it speaks to broader issues than that, but yeah. But that's the best one I can think of off the top of my head. All right, guys, with that being the case, I will sign off for now. I appreciate you guys spending with me. Thank you to the 340 of you who stuck with me until the end. Just a kind reminder, by the way, that you can, of course, subscribe to the channel and, of course, should like the video if you haven't done that already. Also, a fine re casual reminder that if you have Amazon Prime, remember, you can link your Amazon Prime to Twitch, and then you can subscribe to me on Twitch for free, which gives me money but costs you nothing. Jeff Bezos pays me, not you. That's great. Please help Jeff Bezos. Please make Jeff Bezos give me money. I would appreciate it. He probably doesn't need all that money. I would like some of it. So if you can do that on Twitch, that would be helpful. And we will be on tomorrow with something. I don't know. We'll see, probably. And uh, until later, my friends, I hope all is well. Cheers, my friends. Until later, goodbye.